For Shasa, everything seemed to happen at once. Sean's expulsion from bishops was a bombshell that ripped through Weltefrieden. When it happened, Shaza was in Johannesburg, and they had to call him out of a meeting with the representatives of the Chamber of Mines to receive the headmaster's telephone call. On the open line, the headmaster would give no details, and Shaza flew back to Cape Town immediately and drove directly from the airfield to the school. Flabbergasted and seething with anger at the stark details the headmaster gave him, Shaza sent the Jaguar roaring around the lower slopes of Table Mountain towards Veltefrieden. From the first, he had not approved of the woman who Tara had installed in the cottage. She was all the things he despised, with her great sloppy breasts and silly pretensions, which she thought made her avant-garde and artistic. Her paintings were atrocious, daubed primary colours and childish perspectives, and she tried to conceal her lack of talent and taste behind Portuguese cigarettes, sandals and skirts of blindingly vivid designs. He decided to deal with her first. However, she had fled, leaving the cottage in slovenly disarray. Thwarted, Shaza took his anger unabated up to the big house and shouted at Tara as he stormed into the hall. Where's the little blighter? I'm going to skin his backside for him. The other children, all three of them, were peeking over the railing from the second floor gallery. In a fine fever of vicarious terror, Isabella's eyes were as enormous as one of Walt Disney's fawns. Shaza saw them and roared up the stairwell. Back to your own rooms this instant. That goes for you as well, young lady. And they ducked and scampered. As an afterthought, Shaza bellowed after them. And tell that brother of yours I want to see him in the gun room immediately. The three of them raced each other down the passage of the nursery wing, each of them determined to be the bearer of the dreaded summons. The gun room was the family equivalent of Tower Green, where all executions took place. Garrick got there first and pounded on Sean's locked door. Pater wants you immediately, he yelled. In the gun room, Michael joined in, and Isabella, who had been left far behind at the start, piped up breathlessly, He's going to skin your backside! She was flushed and trembling with eagerness, and she hoped desperately that Sean would show her his bottom after Daddy had carried out his threat. She couldn't imagine what it would look like, and she wondered if Daddy would have the skin made into a floor mat like the skins of the zebras and lions in the gun room. It was probably the most exciting thing that had ever happened in her whole life. In the entrance hall, Tara was attempting to calm Shaza. She had seen him in a comparable rage only two or three times during their marriage, always when he fancied the family honour or reputation had been compromised. Her efforts were in vain, for he turned on her with his single eye glittering. Damn you, woman! This is mostly your fault. It was you who insisted on bringing that, that whore to live on Veltefrieden. As Shaza stormed off to the gun room, his voice carried clearly up the stairwell to where Sean was bracing himself to come down and face retribution. Up to that moment, Sean had been so confused by the speed of events that he hadn't been thinking clearly. Now, as he descended the stairs, his mind was racing as he prepared his defence. He passed his mother, still standing in the middle of the chessboard, black and white marble squares of the entrance hall floor, and she gave him a restrained smile of encouragement. I tried to help, darling, she whispered. They had never been close. But now, for once, Shaza's rage made them allies. Thank you, Mater. He knocked on the gunroom door and opened it cautiously when his father roared. He closed it carefully behind him and advanced to the centre of the lion skin where he halted and stood to attention. Beatings at Veltefrieden followed an established ritual. The riding crops were laid out on the bay's gun table, five of them of various lengths, weights and stinging potential. He knew his father would make a show of selecting the correct one for the occasion, and that today it would almost certainly be the long, whippy whalebone. Involuntarily, he looked to the overstuffed leather chair beside the fireplace over which he would be asked to drape himself, reaching over to grip the legs of the chair on the far side. His father was an international polo player, with wrists like steel springs. His strokes made even the headmasters seem like a powder puff. Then, deliberately, Sean closed his mind against fear and lifted his chin 
to stare calmly at his father. Shaza was standing in front of the fireplace, hands clasped behind his back, rocking on the balls of his feet. You have been fired from bishops, he said. Although the headmaster had not specifically mentioned this fact to Sean himself during his extended diatribe, the news did not come as a complete surprise. Yes, sir. I find it hard to believe what I have been told about you. It is true that you were making a spectacle of yourself with this, this, this woman? Yes, sir. That you were letting your friends watch you? Yes, sir. And charging them money for the privilege? Yes, sir. A pound a head? No, sir. What do you mean, no, sir? Two pounds a head, sir. You are a Courtney. What you do reflects directly on every member of this family. Do you realise that? Yes, sir. Don't keep saying that in the name of all that's holy. How could you do it? She started it, sir. I would have never even thought of it without her. Shaza stared at him, and suddenly his rage evaporated. He remembered himself at almost exactly the same age, standing chastened before Saint-Anne. She had not beaten him, but had sent him to a Lysol bath and a humiliating medical examination. He remembered the girl, a saucy little harlot, only a year or two older than he was, with a shock of sun-bleached hair and a sly smile. And he almost smiled himself. She had teased and provoked him, leading him on into folly, and yet he felt a strange nostalgic glow. His first real woman. He might forget a hundred others, but never that one. Sean had seen the anger fade out of his father's eye and sensed that now was the moment to exploit the change of mood. I realise that I have brought a scandal on the family, and I know that I have to take my medicine. His father would like that. It was one of his sayings. Take your medicine like a man. He saw the further softening of his father's regard. I know how stupid I have been, and before my punishment I would just like to say how sorry I am that I have made you ashamed of me. This was not exactly true, and Sean instinctively knew it. His father was angry with him for being caught out, but deep down he was rather proud of his eldest son's now proven virility. The only excuse I have was that I, I just couldn't help myself. She just drove me mad, sir. I couldn't think of anything else but... Well, but what she wanted me to do with her. Shaza understood entirely. He was still having the same sort of problems at nearly forty. What was it that saint said? It's the Dettieri blood. We all have to live with it. He coughed softly, moved by his son's honesty and openness. He was such a fine-looking boy, straight and tall and strong, so handsome and courageous. No wonder the woman had picked on him. He couldn't really be bad, Shaza thought. A bit of a devil, perhaps. A little too cocksure. A little too eager for life. But not really bad. I mean, if boffing a pretty girl is a mortal sin, there is no salvation for any of us, he thought. I'm going to have to beat you, Sean, he said aloud. Yes, sir, I know that. Not a trace of fear, no whining. No, damn it, he was a good boy, a son to be proud of. Shaza went to the gun table and picked up the long whalebone crop, the most formidable weapon in his arsenal. And without being ordered to do so, Sean marched to the armchair and adopted the prescribed position. The first stroke hissed in the air and cracked against his flesh. Then suddenly Shaza grunted with disgust and threw the crop onto the gun table. The stick is for children, and you are no longer a child, Shaza said. Stand up, man! Sean could hardly believe his luck. Although the single stroke had stung like a nest of scorpions, he kept an impassive face and made no effort to rub the seat of his pants. What are we going to do with you? his father demanded. And Sean had the sense to remain silent. You have to finish my trick, Shaza stated flatly. We'll just have to find someone else to take you on. This was not as easy as Shaza had anticipated. He tried Sachs and Rondebosch boys, and then Weinberg boys. The headmasters all knew about Sean Courtney. 
He was, for a short while, the best-known schoolboy in the Cape of Good Hope. In the end, he was accepted by Costello's Academy, a cram school that operated out of a dilapidated Victorian mansion on the other side of Rondebosch Common, and was not particular about its admissions. Sean arrived for the first day, and was gratified to find he was already a celebrity. Unlike the exclusive boys' school, which he had recently left, there were girls in the classrooms. And academic excellence and moral rectitude were not prerequisites for entrance to Costello's academy. Sean had found his spiritual home, and he set about sorting out the most promising of his fellow scholars and organising them into a gang which within a year was virtually running the cram school. His final selection included a half-dozen of the most comely and accommodating young ladies on the academy's roll. As both his father and erstwhile headmaster had noted, Sean was a born leader. Mantra de la Rey stood to attention on the reviewing stand. He wore a severe dark pinstripe suit and a black Homburg hat, with a small spray of carnations and green fern in his buttonhole. This was the uniform of a nationalist cabinet minister. The police band was playing a traditional country air, Di Cap Sonoy, the Cape Town girl, to a lively marching beat, and the ranks of the police cadets stepped out vigorously, passing the stand with their FN rifles at the slope. As each platoon drew level with the dais, they gave Manfred the eyes right, and he returned the salute. They made a grand show with their smart blue uniforms and sparkling brass work, catching the white high-felt sunlight. These athletic young men, proud and eager, their perfect drill formations, their transparent dedication and patriotism filled Manfred de la Rey with a vast sense of pride. Manfred stood to attention while the formations wheeled past him and then formed up in review order on the open parade ground facing the stand. The band played a final ruffle of drums and then fell silent. Resplendent in full-dress uniform and decorations, the police general stepped to the microphone and in a few crisp sentences introduced the minister, then fell back, relinquishing the microphone to Manfred. Manfred had taken especial care with the preparation of his speech, but before he had begun he could not prevent himself from glancing aside to where Heidi sat in the front row of honoured guests. This was her day also and she looked like a blonde Valkyrie, her handsome Teutonic features set off by the wide-brimmed hat and its tall decoration of artificial roses. Few women would have the presence and stature to wear it without looking ridiculous, but on Heidi it was magnificent. She caught his eye and smiled at Manfred. What a woman, he thought. She deserves to be first lady in the land, and I will see that she is one day perhaps sooner than she imagines. He turned back to the microphone and composed himself. He knew that he was a compelling orator, and he enjoyed the fact that thousands of eyes were concentrated upon him. He felt at ease up here on the dais, relaxed and in total control of himself and those below him. You have chosen a life of service to your folk and to your country, he began. He was speaking in Afrikaans and his reference to the folk was quite natural. The intake of police recruits was almost exclusively from the Africana section of the white community. Manfred de la Rey would not have had it any other way. It was desirable that control of the security forces should be vested solidly in the more responsible elements of the nation. Those who understood most clearly the dangers and threats that faced them in the years ahead. Now he began to warn this dedicated body of young men of those dangers. It will require all our courage and fortitude to resist the dark forces which are arrayed against us. We must thank our Maker, the Lord God of our fathers, that in the covenant he made with our ancestors on the battlefield of Blood River, he was guaranteed us his protection and guidance. It needs only that we remain constant and true, trusting him, worshipping him, for the way always to be made smooth for our feet to follow. He ended his address with the act of faith, 
that had lifted the Afrikaner out of poverty and oppression to his rightful place in the land. Believe in your God. Believe in your folk. Believe in yourself. His voice, magnified a hundred times, boomed across the parade ground, and he truly felt the divine and benevolent presence very close to him as he looked out upon their shining faces. Now came the presentation. Out on the field there were shouted orders, and the blue ranks came to attention. A pair of officers stepped forward to flank Manfred, and one of them carried a velvet-lined tray on which were laid out the medals and awards. Reading from the list in his hands, the second officer called the recipients forward. One at a time they left the ranks, marching briskly, to halt before the imposing figure of Manfred de la Rey. He shook hands with each of them, and then pinned the medals upon their chests. Then came the moment, and Manfred felt his pride suffocating him. The last of the award winners was marching towards him across the parade ground, and this one was the tallest and smartest and straightest of them all. In the front rank of guests, Heidi was weeping silently with joy, and she dabbed unashamedly at her tears with a lace handkerchief. Lothar de la Rey came to a halt in front of his father and stood to rigid attention. Neither of them smiled. Their expressions were stern. They stared into each other's eyes. But between them flowed such a current of feeling that made words or smiles redundant. With an effort, Manfred broke that silent rapport and turned to the police colonel beside him. He offered the sword to Manfred, and the engraved scabbard glistened in silver and gold as Manfred took it from him and turned back to his son. The sword of honour, he said. May you wear it with distinction. And he stepped up to Lothar and attached the beautiful weapon to the blanched belt at his son's waist. They shook hands, both of them solemn still, but the brief grip they exchanged expressed a lifetime of love and pride and filial duty. They stood to attention, holding the salute as the band played the national anthem. From the blue of our heavens, from the depths of our seas. And then the parade was breaking up, and young men were swarming forward to find their families in the throng. And there were excited female cries and laughter, and long, fervent embraces as they met. Lothar de la Rey stood between his parents, with the sword hanging at his side, and while he shook the hands of an endless procession of well-wishers, and made modest responses to their fulsome congratulations, neither Manfred nor Heidi could any longer contain their proud and happy smiles. Well done, Lothi, one of Lothar's fellow cadets got through to him at last, and the two lads grinned as they shook hands. No doubt about who was the best man. Now, I was lucky, Lothar laughed self-deprecatingly and changed the subject. Have you been told you're posting yet, Hannes? Yeah, man. I'm being sent down to Natal, somewhere on the coast. How about you? Perhaps we'll be together. No such luck, Lothar shook his head. They're sending me to some little station in the black townships near Vereniging, a place called Sharpville. Sharpville? Bad luck, man. Hannes shook his head with mock sympathy. I've never heard of it. Nor had I. Nobody's ever heard of it, said Lothar with resignation. And nobody ever will. On the 24th of August, 1958, the Prime Minister, Johannes Gerhardus Stredum, Lion of the Waterberg, succumbed to heart disease. He had only been at the head of government for four years, but his passing left a wide gap in the granite cliffs of Afrikanerdom, and like termites whose nest has been damaged, they rushed to repair it. Within hours of the announcement of the Prime Minister's death, Manfred de la Rey was in Shaza's office, accompanied by two of the senior Cape backbenchers of the National Party. We have to try to keep the Northerners out, he announced bluntly. We have to get our man in. Shaza nodded cautiously. He was still regarded by most of the party as an outsider in the cabinet. His influence in the coming election of a new leader would not be decisive, but he was ready to watch and learn as Manfred laid out their strategy for him. 
They have already made Fervut their candidate, he said. All right, he's been in the Senate most of his career and has little experience as an MP, but his reputation is that of a strong man and a clever one. They like the way he has handled the blacks. He has made the name Fervut and the word apartheid mean the same thing. The people know that under him there will be no mixing of races, that South Africa will always belong to the white man. Yeah, agreed one of the others, but he is so brutal. There are ways of doing things, ways of saying things that don't offend people. Our own man is strong also. Donya has introduced the Group Areas Bill and the Separate Representation of Voters Bill. Nobody can accuse him of being a kaffer booty, a nigger lover. But he's got more style, more finesse. The Northerners don't want finesse. They don't want a genteel Prime Minister with sweet lips. They want a man of power, and for what is a talker. Hell, that man can talk, and he's not afraid of work. And as we all know, anybody whom the English press hates so much can't be all bad. They laughed, watching Shaza, waiting to see how he would take it. He was still an outsider, their tame Roynek. And he would not give them the satisfaction of seeing their raillery score. He smiled easily. For foot as canny as an old bull baboon, and quick as a mamba. We'll have to work hard if we're to keep him out, Shaza agreed. They worked hard, all of them. Shaza was convinced that despite his record of introducing racially inspired legislation to the House, Donya's was the most moderate and altruistic of the three men who allowed themselves to be persuaded to stand as candidates for the highest office in the land. As Dr. Hendrik Favut himself said, as he accepted nomination, when a man receives a desperate call from his people, he does not have the right to refuse. On the 2nd of September, 1958, the caucus of the National Party met to choose the new leader. The caucus was made up of 178 nationalist members of parliament and nationalist senators voting together. And for Wood's short term in parliament, that had seemed at first to be a weakness, turned out to be an advantage. For years, Hendrik Favut had been the leader of the Senate and had dominated the upper house by the strength of his personality and the powers of his oratory. The senators, docile and compliant, men whose ranks had been enlarged to enable the governing party to force through distasteful legislation, voted for Favut as a bloc. Donia survived the first ballot, in which Blackie Swat, the Free State's candidate, was eliminated. But on the second ballot, a straight contest between Favut and Donia's, the Northerners closed their ranks and swept Favut into the Premiership by 98 votes to 75. That evening, when, as Prime Minister, Hendrik French Favut broadcast to the nation, he did not try to conceal the fact that his election had been the will of Almighty God. He it is who has ordained that I should lead the people of South Africa in this new period of their lives. Blaine and Santin had driven across from Rhodes Hill. It was a family tradition to gather in this room to listen to important broadcasts. Here they had heard speeches and announcements that had shifted the world they knew on its axis. Declarations of war and peace, the news of the evil mushroom clouds planted in the skies above Japanese cities, the death of kings and beloved rulers, the accession of a queen, to all these and others they had listened together in the blue drawing room of Welter Frieden. Now they sat quietly as the high-pitched, nervously strained, but articulate voice of the new Prime Minister came to them, jarring when he repeated platitudes and well-worn themes. No one need doubt for a single moment that it will always be my aim to uphold the democratic institutions of our country, for they are the most treasured possessions of Western civilization, for what told them and the right of people with other convictions to express their views will be maintained. Just as long as those views are passed by the Government Board of Censors, the Synod of the Dutch Reformed Church, and the Caucus of the National Party, Blaine murmured, a sarcastic qualification for him, and saint nudged him. Oh, do be quiet, Blaine, I want to listen. For Wut had moved on to another familiar subject, how the country's enemies had deliberately misconstrued his racial policies. It was not he who had coined the word apartheid, 
but other dedicated and brilliant minds had foreseen the necessity of allowing all the races of a complicated and fragmented society to develop towards their own separate potential. As the Minister of Bantu Affairs since 1950, it has been my duty to give cohesion and substance to this policy, the only policy which will allow full opportunity for each and every group within its own racial community. In the years ahead, we will not deviate one inch from this course. Tara had been tapping her foot restlessly as she listened, but now she sprang to her feet. I'm sorry, she blurted. I'm feeling a little queasy. I must get a breath of fresh air on the terrace. And she hurried from the room. Santine glanced sharply at Shaza, but he smiled and shrugged, was about to make a light comment when the voice on the radio riveted them all once again. I come now to one of the most, if not the most, sacred ideal of our people, the high-pitched voice filled the room, and that is the formation of the Republic. I know how many of the English-speaking South Africans listening to me tonight are filled with a sense of loyalty to the British Crown. I know also that this divided loyalty has prevented them from always dealing with the real issues on their merits. The ideal of monarchy has too often been a divisive factor in our midst, separating Afrikaners and English speakers when they should have been united. In a decolonizing world, the black man and his newly fledged nations are beginning to emerge as a threat to the South Africa we know and love. Afrikaner and Englishmen can no longer afford to stand apart, but must now link arms as allies, secure and strong in the ideal of a new white republic. My God, Blaine breathed. That's a new line. It used always to be the Afrikaner Republic exclusively, and nobody took it seriously, least of all the Afrikaners. But this time he is serious, and he started something that's going to raise a stink. I remember all too well the controversy over the flag back in the 1920s. That will seem like a love feast compared to the idea of a republic. He broke off to listen as Favut ended. Thus I give you my assurance that from now on the sacred ideal of a republic will be passionately pursued. When the Prime Minister finished speaking, Shaza crossed the room and switched off the radio. Then he turned and stood with his hands thrust deeply into his pockets, and his shoulders hunched as he studied their faces. They were all of them subdued and shaken. For 150 years the country had been British, and there was a pride and a vast sense of security in that state. Now it was to change, and they were afraid. Even Shaza felt strangely bereft and uncertain. Oh, he doesn't mean it. It's just another sop for his own people. They're always ranting about the Republic, Santan said hopefully. But Blaine shook his head. We don't know this man very well yet. We only know what he wrote when he was editor of Transvala and we know with what vigour and determination he has set about segregating our society. There is one thing we have learned about him. He is a man who means exactly what he says, and who will let nothing stand in his way. He reached across and took Santon's hand. No, my heart, you're wrong. He means it. They both looked up at Shaza, and Santon asked for both of them. What will you do, chérie? I am not sure that I will have any choice. They say he brooks no opposition, and I opposed him. I lobbied for Donyas. I may not be on the list when he announces his cabinet on Monday. It'll be hard to move to the back bench again, Blaine remarked. Too hard. And I will not do it. Oh, chérie, Santon cried, you would not resign your seat? After all we have sacrificed, after all our hard work and hopes? We'll know on Monday, Shaza shrugged, trying not to let them see how bitterly disappointed he was. He had held true power for too short a time, just long enough to learn to enjoy the taste of it. He knew, furthermore, that there was so much he had to offer his country, so many of his efforts almost ready for harvesting. It would be hard to watch them wither and die with his own ambitions before he had even tasted the first sweets. But Favut would sack him from his cabinet. He could not doubt it for a moment. 
If you can meet with triumph and disaster, Santon quoted, and then laughed gaily, with only the barest tremor in it. Now, Cherie, let's open a bottle of champagne. It's the only way to treat those impostors of Kipling's. Shahza entered his office in the house and looked around it regretfully. It had been his for five years, and now he would have to pack up his books and paintings and furniture. The panelling and carpeting he would leave as a gift to the nation. He had hoped to make a larger bequest than that, and he grimaced and went to sit behind his desk for the last time and try to assess where he had erred and what he could have done if he had been allowed. The telephone on his desk rang, and he picked it up before his secretary in the outer office could reach it. Uh, this is the Prime Minister's secretary, the voice told him, and for a moment he thought of the dead man and not his successor. The Prime Minister would like to see you as soon as convenient. I'll come right away, of course, Shahza replied, and as he replaced the receiver he thought, Sir, he personally wants to have the pleasure of chopping me down. Favut kept him waiting only ten minutes, and then rose from behind his desk to apologise as Shahza entered his office. Forgive me, it has been a busy day. And Shahza smiled at the understatement. His smile was not forced, for Favut was displaying all his enormous charm, his voice soft and lulling, unlike the higher, harsher tone of his public utterances, and he actually came around the desk and took Shahza's arm in an avuncular grip. But of course I have to speak to you, as I have spoken to all the members of my new cabinet. Shahza started, so that he pulled his arm out of the other man's grip, and they turned to face each other. I am keeping the portfolio of mines and industry open, and of course there is no man better qualified for the job than you. I have liked your presentations to the old cabinet. You know what you are talking about. I cannot pretend not to be surprised, Prime Minister, Shahza told him quietly, and Favut chuckled. It is good to be unpredictable at times. Why? Shahza asked. Why me? Favut cocked his head on the side, a characteristic gesture of interrogation. But Shahza insisted. I know you value straight talk, Prime Minister, so I will say it. You have no reason to like me or to consider me an ally. That is true, Favut agreed, but I don't need sycophants. I have enough of those already. What I have considered is that the job you are doing is vital to the eventual well-being of our land, and that there is no one who could do it better. I'm sure we will learn to work together. Is that all, Prime Minister? You have mentioned that I like to talk straight. Very well. That is not all. You probably heard me begin my premiership with an appeal for a drawing together of the two sections of our white population, to appeal to Boer and Britain to forget old, worn-out antipathy and side by side to build the Republic. How would it look if with the next breath I fired the only Englishman in my government? They both laughed, and then Shahza shook his head. On the matter of the Republic I will oppose you, he warned, and for a moment saw through a chink the cold and monolithic ego of a man who would never bow to the contrary view. And then the chink was closed, and Favut chuckled. And then I will have to convince you that you are wrong. In the meantime, you will be my conscience. Uh, what is the name of the character in the Disney story? Uh, which one? Uh, the story of the puppet. Uh, Pinocchio, is it? What was the name of the cricket? Jiminy Cricket, Shahza told him. Yes, in the meantime, you will be my Jiminy Cricket. Do you accept the task? We both know it is my duty, Prime Minister. As Shahza said it, he thought cynically, isn't it remarkable that once ambition has dictated, duty so readily concurs? They were dining out that night, but Shahza went to Tara's room to tell her the news as soon as he had dressed. She watched him in the mirror as he explained his reasons for accepting the appointment. Her expression was solemn, but her voice had a brittle edge of contempt in it as she said, I'm delighted for you. I know that is what you want, and I know that you will be so busy you will not even notice that I am gone. Gone? he demanded. Our bargain, Shahza. We agreed that I could go away for a while when I felt the need. 
Of course I will return. That was also part of our bargain. He looked relieved. Where will you go and for how long? London, she replied, and I should be away several months. I want to attend a course on archaeology at London University. She tried to hide it from him, but she was wildly, deliriously excited. She had only heard from Molly that afternoon, just after the new cabinet had been announced. Molly had a message. Moses had at last sent for her, and she had already booked passage for Benjamin, Miriam and herself on the Pendennis Castle to Southampton. She would take the child to meet his father. The mail ship sailing was an exciting event in which the citizens of the mother city, of whatever station in life, could join gaily. The deck was crowded and noisy. Paper streamers joined the tall ship to the quayside with a web of colour that fluttered in the southeaster. A coon band on the dock vied with the ship's band high up on the promenade deck, and the old Cape favourite, Alabama, was answered by God be with you till we meet again. Shaza was not there. He had flown up to Volpus Bay to deal with some unforeseen problem at the canning factory. Nor was Sean. He was writing exams at Costello's Academy. But Blaine and Santon brought the other three children down to the docks to see Tara off on her voyage. They stood in a small family group, surrounded by the crowd, each of them holding a paper streamer and waving up at Tara on the first-class A deck. As the gap between the quay and the ship's side opened, the foghorns boomed, and the paper streamers parted and floated down to settle on the dark waters of the inner harbour. The tugs pushed the great bows around until they lined up with the harbour entrance, and under the stern the gigantic propeller chopped the wave into foam and drove her out into Table Bay. Tara ran lightly up the companionway to her stateroom. She had protested only mildly when Shaza had insisted that she cancel her original bookings in tourist and travel first class. My dear, they are bound to be people we know on board. What would they think of my wife travelling steerage? Not steerage, Shaza. Tourist. Everything below a deck is steerage, he had replied. And now she was glad of his snobbery, for the stateroom was a private place where she could have Ben all to herself. It would have excited curiosity if she had been seen with a coloured child on the public deck. As Shaza had pointed out, there were watching eyes on board, and the reports would have flown back to Shaza like homing pigeons. However, Miriam Africa had good-naturedly agreed to wear a servant's livery and to act out the subterfuge of being Tara's maid during the voyage. Her husband had reluctantly let her go with Tara to England, despite the disruption to his own household. Tara had compensated him generously, and Miriam had come aboard with the child registered as her own. Tara hardly left her stateroom during the entire voyage, declining the captain's offer to join his table and shunning the cocktail parties and fancy dress dance. She never tired of being with Moses' son. Her love was a hunger that could never be appeased, and even when, exhausted by her attentions, Benjamin fell asleep in his cot, Tara hovered over him constantly. I love you, she whispered to him. Best in the world after your daddy. And she did not think of the other children, not even Michael. She ordered all their meals to be sent up to her suite, and ate with Benjamin almost jealously taking over his care from Miriam. Only late at night, with the greatest reluctance, did she let her carry the child away to the tourist cabin on the deck below. The days sped by swiftly, and at last, holding Benjamin's hand, she stepped off the gangplank to the boat train in Southampton docks for the ride up to London. Again, at Charles's insistence, she had taken the suite at the Dorchester, overlooking the park that the family always used, with a single room at the back for Miriam and the baby, for which she requested a separate bill and paid in cash out of her own pocket so that Shaza would have no record of it on her bank statement. There was a message from Moses waiting for her at the porter's desk when she registered. She recognised the handwriting. She opened the envelope the moment she entered the suite and felt the cold slide of disappointment. He wrote very formally. Dear Tara, I am sorry I was not able to meet you. 
However, it is necessary for me to attend important talks in Amsterdam with our friends. I will contact you immediately on my return. Yours sincerely, Moses Garmer. She was thrown into black despair by the tone of the letter and the dashing of her expectations. Without Miriam and the child, she would have despaired. However, they passed the waiting days in the parks and zoos and in long walks along the river bank and through London's fascinating alleys and convoluted streets. She shopped for Benjamin at Marks and Spencer and C and A, avoiding Harrods and Selfridges, for those were Shaz's haunts. Tara registered at the university for the course in African archaeology. She did not trust Chaza not to check that she had done so. In accordance with Shaza's other expectations, she even dressed in her most demure twin set and pearls and took a cab up to Trafalgar Square to make a courtesy call on the High Commissioner at South Africa House. She could not avoid his invitation to lunch and had to show a bright face during a meal whose menu and wine list and fellow guests could have been taken straight from a similar gathering at Veltefrieden. She listened to the editor of the Daily Telegraph, who sat beside her, but kept glancing out of the windows at Nelson's tall column, and longed to be free as the cloud of pigeons that circled it. Her duty done, she escaped at last, only just in time to get back to the Dorchester and give Ben his bath. She had bought him a plastic tugboat at Hamley's toy shop, which was a great success, and Ben sat in the bath and chuckled with delight as the tugboat circled him. Tara was laughing and drying her hands when Miriam came through from the lounge to the bathroom. There's someone to see you, Tara. Who is it? Tara demanded, without rising from where she knelt beside the bath. He wouldn't give his name. Miriam kept a straight face. I'll finish bathing Ben. Tara hesitated. She did not want to waste a minute away from her son. Oh, all right, she agreed, and with the towel in her hand she went through to the lounge and stopped abruptly in the doorway. The shock was so intense that her face drained of blood and she swayed giddily and had to snatch the door jam to steady herself. Moses, she whispered, staring at him. He wore a long tan-coloured trench coat and the epauletted shoulders were spattered with raindrops. The coat seemed to accentuate his height and the breadth of his shoulders. She had forgotten the grandeur of his presence. He did not smile, but regarded her with that steady, heart-checking stare of his. Moses, she said again, and took a faltering step towards him. Oh, God, you'll never know how slowly the years have passed since I last saw you. Tara, his voice thrilled every fibre of her being. My wife, and he held out his arms to her. She flew to him and he enfolded her and held her close. She pressed her face to his chest and clung to him, inhaling the rich masculine smell of his body, as warm and exciting as the herby smell of the African noonday. For many seconds neither of them moved or spoke, except for the involuntary tremors that shook Tara's body and the little moaning sound she made in her throat. Then, gently, he held her off, and took her face between his hands and lifted it to look into her eyes, I have thought about you every day, he said, and suddenly she was weeping. The tears streamed down her cheeks and into the corners of her mouth, so that when he kissed her, their metallic salt mingled with the slick taste of his saliva. Miriam brought Benjamin out to them, clean and dry, and dressed in his new blue pyjamas. He regarded his father solemnly. I greet you, my son, Moses whispered. May you grow as strong and beautiful as the land of your birth. And Tara thought that her heart might stop with the pride and sheer joy of seeing them together for the first time. Though the colour of their skins differed, Benjamin was caramel and chocolate cream, while Moses was amber and African bronze, Tara could see the resemblance in the shape of their heads and the set of jaw and brow. They had the same wide-spaced eyes, the same noses and lips, and to her they were the two most beautiful things in her existence. Tara kept the suite at the Dorchester, for she knew that Shaza would contact her there, 
and that any invitations from South Africa House or correspondence from the university would be addressed to her at the hotel. But she moved into Moses' flat off the Bayswater Road. The flat belonged to the Ethiopian emperor and was kept for the use of his diplomatic staff. However, Haley Selassie had placed it at Moses Gama's disposal for as long as he needed it. It was a large, rambling apartment with dark rooms and had a strange mixture of furnishings, well-worn western sofas and easy chairs with hand-woven woolen Ethiopian rugs and wall hangings. The ornaments were African artefacts, carved ebony statuettes, crossed two-handed broadswords, bronze Somali shields and Coptic Christian crosses and icons in native silver studded with semi-precious stones. They slept on the floor, in the African manner, on thin, hard mattresses filled with coir. Moses even used a small wooden headstool as a pillow, though Tara could not accustom herself to it. Benjamin slept with Miriam in the bedroom at the end of the passage. Love-making was a natural part of Moses Gama's life, as eating or drinking or sleeping and yet his skills and his consideration of her needs were an endless source of wonder and delight to her. She wanted more than anything else in life to bear him another child. She tried consciously to open the mouth of her womb, willing it to expand like a flower bud to accept his seed, and long after he had fallen asleep, she lay with her thighs tightly crossed and her knees raised so as not to spill a precious drop, imagining herself a sponge for him, or a bellows to draw his substance deeply into herself. Yet the times they were alone were far too short for Tara, and it irked her that the flat always seemed filled with strangers. She hated to share Moses with them, wanting him all for herself. He understood this, and when she had been churlish and sulky in the presence of others, he reminded her sternly, I am the struggle, Tara. Nothing, nobody, comes ahead of that. Not even my own longings, not my life itself, can come before my duty to the cause. If you take me, then you make that same sacrifice. To moderate the severity of his words, he lifted her in his arms and carried her to the mattress, and made love to her until she sobbed and rolled her head from side to side, delirious with the power and wonder of it. And then he told her, You have as much of me as any person will ever have. Accept that without complaint, and be grateful for it, for we never know when one of us may be called to sacrifice it all. Live now, Tara. Live for our love this day, for there may never be a tomorrow. Forgive me, Moses, she whispered. I have been so small and petty. I will not disappoint you again. So she put aside her jealousy and joined in his work and looked upon the men and women who came to the Bayswater Road, no longer as strangers and interlopers, but as comrades, part of their life and the struggle. Then she could realise what a fascinating slice of humanity they represented. Most of them were Africans, tall Kikuyus from Kenya, Jomo Kenyatta's young men, the warriors of Mau Mau, once even the little man with a great heart and brain, Hastings Banda, spent an evening with them. There were Shonas and Shangans from Rhodesia, Kozas and Zulus from her own South Africa, and even a few of Moses' own tribe from Avambaland. They had formed a fledgling freedom association which they called Southwest African People's Organization, and they wanted Moses' patronage, which he gave them willingly. Tara found it difficult to think of Moses as belonging to a single tribe. All of Africa was his fief. He spoke most of their separate languages and understood their specific fears and aspirations. If ever the word African described one man, that man was Moses Gama. There were others who came to the flat in Bayswater Road, Hindus and Muslims and men of the Northlands, from Ethiopia and Sudan and Mediterranean Africa, some of them still living under colonial tyranny, others newly liberated, and eager to help their suffering fellow Africans. There were white men and women also, speaking in the accents of Liverpool and the North Country, of the coal mines or the mills, and other white men and women whose English was halting and laboured, but whose hearts were fierce, patriots from Poland and East Germany and the Soviet bloc, some from Mother Russia herself. 
all had a common love of freedom and hatred of the oppressor. From the unlimited letter of credit that Shaza had given her to his London bank, Tara filled the flat with good food and liquor, taking a vindictive pleasure in paying out of Shaza's money for the very best fillet steak and choice lamb, for turbo and sole and lobster. For the first time she derived pleasure from ordering burgundies and clarets of the best vintages and noblest estates, about which she had listened to Shaza lecturing his dinner guests so pompously. She laughed delightedly when she watched the enemies of all Shaza stood for, the ones called the bringers of darkness, quaffing his wines as though they were Coca-Cola. She had not prepared food for a long time. The chef at Veltefrieden would have been mortified if she had attempted to do so. And now she enjoyed working with some of the other women in the kitchen. The Hindu wives showed her how to make wondrous curries, and the Arab women prepared lamb in a dozen exciting ways, so that every meal was a feast and an adventure. From the impecunious students to the heads of revolutionary governments and the leaders in exile of captive nations, they came to talk and plan, to eat and drink, and exchange ideas even more heady than the wines that Tara poured for them. Always Moses Gama was at the centre of the excitement. His vast brooding presence seemed to inspire and direct their energies, and Tara realised that he was making bonds, forging loyalties and friendships to carry the struggle onwards to the next plateau. She was immensely proud of him, and humbly proud of her own small part in the grand enterprise. For the very first time in her life, she felt useful and important. Until the present time, she had spent her life in trivial and meaningless activity. By making her a part of his work, Moses had made her a whole person at last. Impossible as it seemed, during those enchanted months, her love for him was multiplied a hundredfold. Brutfold. 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 Sometimes they travelled together, when Moses was invited to speak to some important group or to meet representatives of a foreign power. They went to Sheffield and Oxford to address elements from opposite ends of the political spectrum, the British Communist Party and the Association of Conservative Students. One weekend they flew to Paris to meet with officials from the French Directorate of Foreign Affairs, and a month later they even went to Moscow together. Tara travelled on her British passport and spent the day sightseeing with her Russian in-tourist guide while Moses was closeted in secret talks in the offices of the 4th Directorate overlooking the Gorky Prospect. When they returned to London, Moses and some of his exiled fellow South Africans organised a protest rally in Trafalgar Square directly opposite the imposing edifice of South Africa House with its frieze of animal head sculptures and colonnaded front entrance. Tara could not join the demonstration, for Moses warned her that they would be photographed with telescopic lenses from the building, and forbade her to expose herself to the racist agents. She was far too valuable to the cause. Instead, she struck upon a delightfully ironic twist, and telephoned the High Commissioner. He invited her to lunch again. She watched from his own office, sitting in one of his easy chairs in the magnificent stinkwood panelled room, while below her in the square Moses stood beneath a banner, Apartheid is a crime against humanity, and made a speech to 500 demonstrators. Her only regret was that the wind and the traffic prevented her hearing his words. He repeated them to her that evening as they lay together on the hard mattress on the floor of their bedroom, and she thrilled to every single word. One lovely English spring morning they walked arm in arm through Hyde Park and Benjamin threw crumbs to the ducks in the serpentine. They watched the riders in Rotten Row and admired the show of spring blooms in the gardens as they passed them on their way up to Speaker's Corner. On the lawns, the holiday crowds were taking advantage of the unseasonable sunshine and many of the men were shirtless while the girls had pulled their skirts high on their thighs as they lolled on the grass. The lovers were intertwined shamelessly, and Moses frowned. Public displays of this kind offended his African morality. As they arrived at Speaker's Corner, they passed the militant 
homosexuals and Irish republicans on their upturned milk crates and went to join the group of black speakers. Moses was instantly recognised. He'd become a well-known figure in these circles and half a dozen men and women hurried to meet him. All of them were coloured South African expatriates and all of them were eager to give him the news. They have acquitted them. They have set them all free. Nokwi, Magatu, Nelson Mandela, they are all free. Judge Rumpf found every one of them not guilty of treason. Moses Gama stopped dead in his tracks and glowered at them as they surrounded him, dancing joyfully and laughing in the pale English sunlight, these sons and daughters of Africa. I do not believe it, Moses snarled angrily, and somebody shoved a crumpled copy of the Observer at him. Here, read it, it's true. Moses snatched the newspaper from him. He read swiftly, scanning the front page article. His face was set and bleak, and then abruptly he thrust the paper into his pocket and shouldered his way out of the group. He strode away down the tarmac pathway, a tall, brooding figure, and Tara had to run with Benjamin to catch up with him. Moses, wait for us! He did not even glance at her, but his fury was evident in the set of his shoulders and the fixed snarl on his lips. What is it, Moses? What has made you so angry? We should rejoice that our friends are free. Please speak to me, Moses. Don't you understand? he demanded. Are you so witless that you do not see what has happened? I, I, I don't. I'm sorry. They have come out of this with enormous prestige, especially Mandela. I had thought that he would spend the rest of his life in prison, or better still, that they would have dropped him through the trap of the gallows. Moses! Tara was shocked. How can you speak like that? Nelson Mandela is your comrade. Nelson Mandela is my rival until the death, he told her flatly. There can only be one ruler in South Africa, either him or me. I do not understand. You understand very little, woman. It is not necessary that you should. All you must learn to do is obey me. She annoyed and irritated him with her perpetual moods and jealousies. He found it more difficult each day to accept her clawing adoration. Her soft, pale flesh had begun to revolt him and each time it took more of an effort to feign passion. He longed for the day that he could be rid of her, but that day was not yet. I am sorry, Moses, if I have been stupid and made you angry. They walked on in silence, but when they came back to the serpentine, Tara asked diffidently, What will you do now? I have to lay claim to my rightful place as the leader of the people. I cannot allow Mandela to have a clear field. What will you do? she repeated. I must go back. Back to South Africa. Oh, no, she gasped. You cannot do that. It's too dangerous, Moses. They will seize you the minute you set foot on South African soil. No, he shook his head. Not if I have your help. I will remain underground, but I will need you. Of course, whatever you want, but, my darling, what, what will you hope to achieve by taking such a dreadful risk? With an effort, he put aside his anger and looked down at her. Do you remember where we first met, the first time we spoke to each other? In the corridors of the Houses of Parliament, she answered promptly. I'll never forget. He nodded. You asked me what I was doing there, and I replied that I would tell you one day. This is the day. He spoke for another hour, softly, persuasively, and as she listened, her emotions rose and fell, alternating between a fierce joy and a pervading dread. Will you help me? he asked at the end. Oh, I am so afraid for you. Will you do it? There is nothing I can deny you, she whispered. Nothing. A week later, Tara telephoned Santan at Rhodes Hill and was surprised by the clarity of the connection. She spoke to each of the children in turn. Sean was monosyllabic and seemed relieved to surrender the telephone to Gary, who was solemn and pedantic in his first year at business school. It was like talking to a little old man, and Gary's single topic of original news was the fact that his father had at last allowed him to start work part-time as an office boy at Courtney Mining and Finance. 
Pater's paying me two pounds ten shillings a day, he announced proudly, and soon I am to have my own office with my name on the door. When his turn came to speak to her, Michael read her a poem of his own, about the sea and the gulls. It was really very good, so her enthusiasm was genuine. I love you so much, he whispered. Please come home soon. Isabella was petulant. What present are you going to bring me, she demanded. Daddy bought me a gold locket with a real diamond. And Tara was guiltily relieved when her daughter passed the telephone back to Santan. Don't worry about Bella, Santan soothed her. We have had a little confrontation, and Mademoiselle's feathers are a wee bit ruffled. I want to buy a coming-home present for Shaza, Tara told her. I have found the most gorgeous medieval altar that has been converted into a chest. I thought it would be just perfect for his cabinet office at the house. Won't you measure the length of the wall on the right of the desk, under the Perneuf paintings? I want to be certain it will fit in there. Santon sounded a little puzzled. It was unusual for Tara to show any interest in antique furniture. Of course I will measure it for you, she agreed dubiously. But remember, Shaza has very conservative tastes. I wouldn't choose anything too... Um, she hesitated delicately, not wanting to denigrate her daughter-in-law's taste. Uh, too obvious or flamboyant. I'll phone you tomorrow evening, Tara did not acknowledge the advice. You can read me the measurements then. Two days later, Moses accompanied her when she returned to the antique dealer in Kensington High Street. Together they made meticulous measurements of both the exterior and interior of the altar. It was a truly splendid piece of work. The lid was inlaid with mosaic of semi-precious stones, while effigies of the apostles guarded the four corners. They were carved in ivory and rare woods, and decorated with gold leaf. The panels depicted scenes of Christ's agony, from the scourging to the crucifixion. Only after careful examination did Moses nod with satisfaction. Yes, it will do very well. Tara gave the dealer a bank draft for six thousand pounds. Price is Shaz's yardstick of artistic value, she explained to Moses while they waited for his friends to come and collect the piece. At six thousand pounds he won't be able to refuse to have it in his office. The dealer was reluctant to hand the chest over to the three young black men who arrived in an old van in response to Moses' summons. It's a very fragile piece of craftsmanship, he protested. I'd feel a lot happier if you entrusted the packing and shipping to a firm of experts. I can recommend... Oh, please don't worry, Tara assured him. I accept full responsibility from now on. It's such a beautiful thing, the dealer said. I would simply curl up and die if it were ever scratched. He wrung his hands piteously as they carried it out and loaded it into the back of the van. A week later, Tara flew back to Cape Town. The day after the crate cleared customs in Cape Town docks, Tara held a small but select surprise party in Shaza's cabinet office to present him with her gift. The Prime Minister was unable to attend, but three cabinet ministers came, and with Blaine and Santon and a dozen others crowded into Shaza's suite to drink Bollinger champagne and admire the gift. Tara had removed the rosewood Georgian sofa table that had previously stood against the panelled wall and replaced it with the chest. Shaza had some idea of what was in store. Santan had dropped a discreet hint, and, of course, the charge had appeared on his latest statement from Lloyd's Bank. Six thousand pounds? Shaza had been appalled. That's the price of a new Rolls. What on earth was the damned woman thinking of? It was ridiculous buying him extravagant gifts, for which he paid himself. Knowing Tara's tastes, he dreaded his first view of it. It was covered by a Venetian lace cloth when Shaza entered his office, and he eyed it apprehensively as Tara said a few pretty words about how much she owed him, what a fine and generous husband, and what a good father he was to her children. Ceremoniously, Tara lifted the lace cloth off the chest, and there was an involuntary gasp of admiration from everyone in the room. The ivory figurines had mellowed to a soft buttery yellow, and the gold leaf and the royal patina of age upon it. They crowded closer to examine it, 
and Shaza felt his unreasonable antipathy towards the gift cool swiftly. He would never have guessed that Tara could show such taste. Instead of the garish monstrosity he had expected, this was a truly great work of art. And if his instinct was correct, which it almost always was, it was also a first-class investment. I do hope you like it, Tara asked him with unusual timidity. It's magnificent, he told her heartily. You don't think it should be under the window? I like it very well just where you put it, he answered her, and then dropped his voice so nobody else could overhear. Sometimes you surprise me, my dear. I'm truly very touched by your thoughtfulness. You too were kind and thoughtful to let me go to London, she replied. I could skip the meeting this afternoon and get home early this evening, he suggested, glancing down at her bosom. Oh, I wouldn't want you to do that, she answered quickly, surprised by her own physical revulsion at the idea. I'm certain to be exhausted by this afternoon. It's such a strain. So our bargain still stands. To the letter, he asked. I think that's wiser that way, don't you? Moses flew from London directly to Delhi and had a series of friendly meetings with Indira Gandhi, the president of the Indian Congress Party. She gave Moses the warmest encouragement and promises of help and recognition. At Bombay, he went on board a Liberian registered tramp steamer with a Polish captain. Moses signed on as a deckhand for the voyage to Lorenzo Marx in Portuguese Mozambique. The tramp called in at Victoria in the Seychelles Islands to discharge a cargo of rice and then sailed direct for Africa. In the harbour of Lorenzo Marx, Moses said goodbye to the jovial Polish skipper and slipped ashore in the company of five members of the crew who were bound for the notorious red-light area of the seaport. His contact was waiting for him in a dingy nightclub. The man was a senior member of the underground freedom organisation which was just beginning its armed struggle against Portuguese colonial rule. They ate the huge juicy Mozambique prawns, for which the club was famous, and drank the tart green wine of Portugal, while they discussed the advancement of the struggle and promised each other the support and assistance of comrades. When they had eaten, the agent nodded to one of the bar girls, and she came to the table and, after a few minutes of arch conversation, took Moses' hand and led him through the rear door of the bar to her room at the end of the yard. The agent joined them there after a few minutes, and while the girl kept watch at the door to warn them of a surprise raid by the colonial police, the man handed Moses the travel documents he had prepared for him, a small bundle of second-hand clothing, and sufficient escudos to see him across the border and as far as the Vitvatesrand gold mines. The next afternoon, Moses joined a group of a hundred or more labourers at the railway station. Mozambique was an important source of labour for the gold mines, and the wages earned by her citizens made a large contribution to the economy. Authentically dressed and in possession of genuine papers, Moses was indistinguishable from any other in the shuffling line of workers, and he went aboard the third-class railway coach without even a glance from the uninterested white Portuguese official. They left the coast in the late afternoon, climbed out of the muggy tropical heat, and entered the hilly forests of the Lowfelt to approach the border post of Kamati Port early the following morning. As the coach rumbled slowly over the low iron bridge, it seemed to Moses that they were crossing not a river, but a great ocean. He was filled with a strange blend of dismay and joy, of dread and anticipation. He was coming home, and yet home was a prison for him and his people. It was strange to hear Afrikaans spoken again, guttural and harsh, but made even more ugly to Moses' ear because it was the language of oppression. The officials here were not the indolent and slovenly Portuguese. Dauntingly brisk and efficient, they examined his papers with sharp eyes and questioned him brusquely in that hated language. However, Moses had already masked himself in the protective veneer of the African. His face was expressionless, and his eyes blank, just a black face among millions of black faces, and they passed him through. Swart Hendrik 
did not recognize him when he slouched into the general dealer's store in Drake's farm township. He was dressed in ill-fitting hand-me-downs and wore an old golfing cap pulled down over his eyes. Only when he straightened up to his full height and lifted the cap did Swat Hendrik start and exclaim in amazement, then seized his arm and, casting nervous glances over his shoulder, hustled his brother through into the little cubicle at the back of the store that he used as an office. They are watching this place, he whispered agitatedly. Is your head full of fever that you walk in here in plain daylight? Only when they were safely in the locked office and he had recovered from the shock did he embrace Moses. A part of my heart has been missing but is now restored. He shouted over the rhino board partition wall of his office. Rally, come here immediately, boy and his son came to peer in astonishment at his famous uncle, and then kneel before him, lift one of Moses' feet, and place it on his own head in the obeisance to a great chief. Smiling, Moses lifted him to his feet and embraced him, questioned him about his schooling and his studies, and then let him respond to Swart Hendrik's order. Go to your mother. Tell her to prepare food, a whole chicken and plenty of maize meal porridge, and a gallon of strong tea with plenty of sugar. Your uncle is hungry. They stayed locked in Swat Hendrik's office until late that night, for there was much to discuss. Swat Hendrik made a full report of all their business enterprises, the state of the secret mine workers' union, the organization of their buffaloes, and then gave him all the news of their family and close friends. When at last they left the office and crossed to Swat Hendrik's house, he took Moses' arm and led him to the small bedroom which was always ready for his visits. And as he opened the door, Victoria rose from the low bed on which she had been sitting patiently. She came to him, and, as the child had done, prostrated herself in front of him and placed his foot upon her head. "'You are my son,' she whispered. "'Since you went away, I have been in darkness.' I sent one of the buffaloes to fetch her from the hospital, Swat Hendrick explained. You did the right thing. Moses stooped and lifted the Zulu girl to her feet, and she hung her head shyly. We will talk again in the morning. Swat Hendrick closed the door quietly, and Moses placed his forefinger under Vicky's chin and lifted it so he could look at her face. She was even more beautiful than he remembered an African Madonna with a face like a dark moon. For a moment he thought of the woman he had left in London, and his senses cringed as he compared her humid white flesh, soft as putty, to this girl's glossy hide, firm and cool as polished onyx. His nostrils flared to her spicy African musk, so different from the other woman's thin, sour odour, which she tried to disguise with flowery perfumes. When Vicky looked up at him and smiled, the whites of her eyes and her perfect teeth were luminous and ivory bright in her lovely dark face. When they had purged their first passion, they lay under the thick caross of hyrax skins and talked the rest of the night away. He listened to her boast of her exploits in his absence. She had marched to Pretoria with the other women to deliver a petition to the new Minister of Bantu Affairs who had replaced Dr. Favut when he had become Prime Minister. The march had never reached the Union buildings. The police had intercepted it and arrested the organisers. She had spent three days and nights in prison, and she related her humiliations with such humour, giggling as she repeated the Alice in Wonderland exchanges between the magistrate and herself, that Moses chuckled with her. In the end, the charges of attending an unlawful assembly and incitement to public violence had been dropped, and Vicky and the other women had been released. But I am a battle-trained warrior now, she laughed. I have bloodied my spear like the Zulus of old King Shaka. I am proud of you, he told her. But the true battle is only just beginning. And he told her a small part of what lay ahead for all of them. And in the yellow flickering light of the lantern, she watched his face avidly, and her eyes shone. Before they at last drifted off into sleep, the false dawn was framing the single small window, and Vicky murmured with her lips against his naked chest, How long will you stay this time, my lord? Not as long as I would wish. 
He stayed on three more days at Drake's farm, and Vicky was with him every night. Many visitors came when they heard that Moses Garma had returned, and most of them were the fierce younger men of Amkonta Wisizwe, the spear of the nation, the warriors eager for action. Some of the older men of the Congress who came to talk with Moses left disturbed by what they had heard, and even Swat Hendrik was worried. His brother had changed. He could not readily tell in what way he had changed, but the difference was there. Moses was more impatient and restless. The mundane details of business and the day-to-day -day running of the buffaloes and the trade union committees no longer seemed to hold his attention. It is as though he has fastened his eyes upon a distant hilltop and cannot see anything in between. He speaks only of strange men in distant lands, and what do they think or say that concerns us here? He grumbled to his twin's mother, his only real confidant. He is scornful of the money we have made and saved, and says that after the revolution, money will have no value, that everything will belong to the people. Swat Hendrick broke off to think for a moment of his stores and his shabines, the bakeries and herds of cattle in the reservations, which belonged to him, the money in the post office savings book, and in the white man's bank, and the cash that he kept hidden in many secret places, some of it even buried under the floor upon which he now sat and drank the good beer brewed by his favourite wife. I am not sure that I wish all things to belong to the people, he muttered thoughtfully. The people are cattle, lazy and stupid. What have they done to deserve the things for which I have worked so long and hard? Perhaps it is a fever. Perhaps your great brother has a worm in his bowel, his favourite wife suggested. I will make a muti for him that will clear his guts and his skull. Swart Hendrick shook his head sadly. He was not at all certain that even one of his wife's devastating laxatives would drive the dark schemes from his brother's head. Of course, long ago he had talked and dreamed strange and wild things with his brother. Moses had been young, and that was the way of young men. But now the frosts of wisdom were upon Hendrick's head, and his belly was round and full, and he had many sons and herds of cattle. He had not truly thought about it before, but he was a man contented. True, he was not free, but then he was not sure what free really meant. He loved and feared his brother very much, but he was not sure that he wanted to risk all he had for a word of uncertain meaning. We must bend down and destroy the whole monstrous system, his brother said. But it occurred to Swat Hendrick that in the burning down might be included his stores and bakeries. We must goad the land. We must make it wild and ungovernable, like a great stallion, so that the oppressor is hurled to earth from his back, his brother said. But Hendrik had an uncomfortable image of himself and his cosy existence, taking that same painful toss. The rage of the people is a beautiful and sacred thing. We must let it run free, Moses said. And Hendrik thought of the people running freely through his well-stocked premises. He had also witnessed the rage of the people in Durban during the Zulu rioting, and the very first concern of every man had been to provide himself with a new suit of clothing and a radio from the looted Indian stores. The police are the enemies of the people. They too will perish in the flames, Moses said. And Hendrik remembered that when the faction fighting between the Zulus and the Koza had swept through Drake's farm the previous November, it was the police who had separated them and prevented many more than forty dead. They had also saved his stores from being looted in the uproar. Now Hendrik wondered just who would prevent them killing each other after the police had been burned, and just what day-to-day -day existence would be like in the townships when each man made his own laws. However, Swart Hendrik was ashamed of his treacherous relief when three days later Moses left Drake's farm and moved to the house at Ravonia. Indeed, it was Swart Hendrik who had gently pointed out to his brother the danger of remaining when almost everybody in the township knew he had returned, and all day long there was a crowd of idlers in the street hoping for a glimpse of Moses Gama, the beloved leader. It was only a matter of time before the police heard about it through their informers. The young warriors of Amkonte Wisizwe willingly acted as Moses' scouts in the weeks that followed. They arranged the meetings, the small clandestine gatherings of the most fierce and bloody-minded amongst their own ranks. After Moses had spoken to them, 
The smouldering resentments which they felt towards the conservative and pacific leadership of the Congress was ready to burst into open rebellion. Moses sought out and talked with some of the older members of the Congress, who, despite their age, were radical and impatient. He met secretly with the cell leaders of his own buffaloes, without the knowledge of Hendrik Tabaka, for he had sensed the change in his brother, the cooling of his political passions, which had never boiled at the same white heat as Moses' own. For the first time in all the years, he no longer trusted him entirely. Like an axe too long in use, Hendrik had lost the keen, bright edge, and Moses knew that he must find another, sharper weapon to replace him. The younger ones must carry the battle forward, he told Vicky Dinazulu. Rally, and yes, you also, Vicky. The struggle is passing into your hands. At each meeting, he listened as long as he spoke, picking up the subtle shifts in the balance of power which had taken place in the years that he had been in foreign lands. It was only then that he realized how much ground he had lost, how far he had fallen behind Mandela in the councils of the African National Congress and the imagination of the people. It was a serious error on my part to go underground and leave the country, he mused. If only I had stayed to take my place in the dock beside Mandela and the others. Oh, the risk was too great, Vicky made excuse for him. If there had been another judgment, if any of the Boer judges other than Rumpf had tried them, they might have gone to the gallows, and if you had gone with them, the cause would have died upon the rope with all of you. You cannot die, my husband, for without you we are children without a father. Moses growled angrily. And yet Mandela stood in the dock and made it a showcase for his own personality. Millions who had never had his name before saw his face daily in their newspapers and his words became part of the language. Moses shook his head. Simple words, Amandla and Ngawetu, he said, and everybody in the land listened. They know your name also and your wants, my lord. Moses glared at her. I do not want you to try to placate me, woman. We both know that while they were in prison during the trial and I was in exile, they formally handed over the leadership to Mandela. Even old Latuli gave his blessing, and since his acquittal, Mandela has embarked on a new initiative. I know that he has been travelling around the country in fifty different disguises, consolidating that leadership. I must confront him and arrest the leadership back from him very soon, or it will be too late and I will be forgotten and left behind. What will you do, my lord? How will you unseat him? He is riding high now. What can we do? Mandela has a weakness. He is too soft, too placatory towards the Boers. I must exploit that weakness, he said it quietly, but there was such a fierce light in his eyes that Victoria shivered involuntarily, and then with an effort closed her mind against the dark images his words had conjured up. He is my husband, she told herself fervently. He is my lord, and whatever he says or does is the truth and the right. The confrontation took place in the kitchen at Pucks Hill. Outside the sky was pregnant with leaden thunderclouds, dark as bruises that cast an unnatural gloom across the room and Marcus Archer switched on the electric lights that hung above the long table in their pseudo-antique brass fittings. The thunder crashed like artillery and rolled heavily back and forth through the heavens. Outside, the lightning flared in brilliant, crackling white light, and the rain poured from the eaves in a rippling silver curtain across the windows. They raised their voices against tumultuous nature so that they were shouting at each other. They were the high command of Amkontawe Siswe, twelve men in all, all of them black except Joe Cicero and Marcus Archer, but only two of them counted, Moses Gama and Nelson Mandela. All the others were silent, relegated to the role of observers, while these two, like dominant black-maned lions, battled for the leadership of the pride. If I accept what you propose... Nelson Mandela was standing, leaning forward with clenched fists on the tabletop. We will forfeit the sympathy of the world. You have already accepted the principle of armed revolt that I have edged upon you all these years, 
Moses leaned back in the wooden kitchen chair, balancing on its two back legs, with his arms folded across his chest. You have resisted my call to battle, and instead you have wasted our strength in feeble demonstrations of defiance, which the Boers crushed down contemptuously. Our campaigns have united the people, Mandela cried. He had grown a short, dark beard since Moses had last seen him. It gave him the air of a true revolutionary, and Moses admitted to himself that Mandela was a fine-looking man, tall and strong and brimming with confidence, and a formidable adversary. They have also given you a good look at the inside of a white man's jail, Moses told him contemptuously. The time for those childish games has passed. It is time to strike ferociously at the enemy's heart. You know we have agreed, Mandela was standing. You know we have reluctantly agreed to use of force. Now Moses leapt to his feet so violently that his chair was flung, crashing against the wall behind him. Reluctantly? He leaned forward across the table until his eyes were inches from Mandela's dark eyes. Yes, you are as reluctant as an old woman and timid as a virgin. What kind of violence is this that you propose? Dynamiting a few telegraph poles, blowing up a telephone exchange, huh? Moses' tone was withering with scorn. Next you will blow up a, a public shithouse and expect the boys to come cringing to you for terms. You are naive, my friend. Your eyes are full of stars and your head full of sunny dreams. These are hard men you are taking on, and there is only one way you will get their attention. Make them bleed and rub their noses in the blood. We will attack only inanimate targets, Mandela said. There will be no taking of human life. We are not murderers. We are warriors, Moses dropped his voice, but that did not reduce its power. His words seemed to shimmer in the gloomy room. We are fighting for the freedom of our people. We cannot afford the scruples with which you seek to shackle us. The younger men at the foot of the table stirred with a restless eagerness, and Joe Cicero smiled slightly. But his eyes were fathomless, and his smile was thin and cruel. Our violent acts should be symbolic, Mandela tried to explain. But Moses rode over him. Symbols! We have no patience with symbolic acts. In Kenya, the warriors of Mau Mau took the little children of the white settlers and held them up by their feet and chopped between their legs with razor-sharp pangas and threw the pieces into the pit toilets. And that is bringing the white man to the conference table. That is the type of symbol the white men understand. We will never sink to such barbarism, Nelson Mandela said firmly and Moses leaned even closer to him, and their eyes locked. As they stared at each other, Moses was thinking swiftly. He had forced his opponent to make a stand, to commit himself irrevocably in front of the militants of the high command. Word of his refusal to engage in unlimited warfare would be swiftly passed to the youth leaguers and the young hawks, to the buffaloes and the others who made up the foundation of Moses' personal support. He would not push Mandela further now, that could only lose Moses some of his gains. He would not give Mandela the opportunity to explain that he might be willing to use harder measures in the future. He had made Mandela appear a pacifist in the eyes of the militants, and in contrast had shown them his own fierce heart. He drew back disdainfully from Nelson Mandela, and he gave a soft, scornful chuckle as he glanced at the young men at the end of the table, and shook his head as though he had given up on a dull and stubborn child. Then he sat down, crossed his arms over his chest, and let his chin sink forward on his chest. He took no further part in the conference, remaining a massive brooding presence. By his very silence mocking Mandela's proposal for limited acts of sabotage on government property. He had given them fine words, but Moses Gama knew that they would need deeds before they all accepted him as the true leader. I will give them a deed, such a deed that will leave not a doubt in their minds, he thought, and his expression was grim and determined. The motorcycle was a gift from his father, it was a huge Harley Davidson with a seat like a cowboy saddle, and the gear shift was on the side of the silver tank. 
Sean was not quite sure why Shaza had given it to him. His final results at Costello's Academy didn't merit such paternal generosity. Perhaps Shaza was relieved that he had managed to scrape through at all, and on the other hand, perhaps he felt that encouragement was what Sean needed now, or again it might merely be an expression of Shaza's guilt feelings towards his eldest son. Sean didn't care to consider it too closely. It was a magnificent machine, all chrome and enamel and red glass diamond reflectors, flamboyant enough to catch the eye of any young lady, and Sean had wound it up to well over the ton on the straight stretch of road beyond the airport. Now, however, the engine was burbling softly between his knees, and as they reached the crest of the hill, he switched off the headlight, and then, as gravity took the heavy machine, he cut the engine. They freewheeled down silently in darkness, and there were no street lights in this elegant suburb. The plots of land around each grand home were the size of small farms. Near the foot of the hill, Sean swung the Harley Davidson off the road. They bumped through a shallow ditch into a clump of trees. They climbed off, and Sean pulled the motorcycle up on its kickstand. Okay, he asked his companion. Rufus was not one of Sean's friends whom he could invite back to Veltafrieden to meet the folks. Sean had only met him through their mutual love for motorcycles. He was smaller than Sean by at least four inches, and at first glance appeared to be a skinny runt of a lad with a grey complexion, as though road grime and sump oil had soaked into his skin. He had nervously shy mannerisms, hanging his head and avoiding eye contact, it had taken some time for Sean to realise that Rufus's lean body was sinewy hard, that he was as quick and agile as a whippet, and that his whining voice and shifty eyes hid a sharp, streetwise intelligence and a caustic and irreverent wit. It had not taken long after that for him to be promoted to the rank of principal lieutenant in Sean's gang. Since graduating without particular distinction from Costello's academy, his father had insisted that Sean enter articles with the object of one day becoming a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants. The auditors of the Courtney Mining and Finance, Messrs Rifkin and Markovich, had been prevailed upon, not without some misgivings on their part, to accept Sean as an articled clerk. This employment was not as dreary as Sean had first imagined. He had no compunction in using the family name, and his boundless charm to work himself into the plummiest audits preferably of those companies which employed a large female staff, and none of the senior partners had courage enough to report to Shaza Courtney that his favourite son was on a free ride. The Courtney account was worth almost a quarter of a million pounds annually. Sean was never more than an hour late for work in the morning, his hangover or his lack of sleep hidden by gold-framed aviator's glasses and his brilliant smile. A little judicious rest during the morning, and some light banter with the typists and female clerks would set him up for a lunch at the Mount Nelson or Kelvin Grove, which ended just in time for a swift return to the office to hand in an imaginative report to the senior partner, after which he was free for a game of squash or an hour's polo practice at Veltafrieden. He usually took dinner at home. It was cheaper than eating out, and although Shaza added substantially to the miserly salary paid by Messrs Rifkin and Markovich, Sean was always in a financial crisis. After dinner, he was free to shed his dinner jacket and black tie and change into a leather cycling jacket and steel-shod boots, and then his other life beckoned, the life so different from his diurnal existence, a life of excitement and danger, full of colourful, fascinating beings, of eager women and satisfying companions, of deliberate risks and wild adventures, like the one this evening. Rufus unzipped his black leather jacket and grinned at him. Ready, willing and able, as the actress said to the bishop. Under the jacket he wore a black roll-neck sweater, black trousers and on his head a black cloth cap. They didn't have to discuss what they were about to do. They had worked together on the same kind of job four times already and all the planning had been gone over in detail. However, Rufus's grin was pale and tense in the starlight beneath the trees. This was their most ambitious project yet. Sean felt the delicious blend of fear and excitement like raw spirit in his blood, tingling and charging him. This was what he did it for, this feeling, this indescribable euphoria with which danger always charged him. This was just the first tickle of it. 
It would grow stronger, more possessing, as the danger increased. He often wondered just how high he could go. There must be a zenith beyond which it was not possible to rise, but unlike the sexual climax, which was intense but so fleeting, Sean knew he had not even approached the ultimate thrill of danger. He wondered what it would be like killing a man with his bare hands, killing a woman the same way, but doing it as she reached her own climax beneath him. The very idea of that always gave him an aching erection, but until those opportunities presented themselves, he would savour the lesser moments such as these. Nail? Rufus asked, offering him his cigarette tin. But Sean shook his head. He wanted nothing to blunt his enjoyment, not nicotine nor alcohol. He wanted to experience the utmost enjoyment of every instant. Smoke half of it and then follow me, he ordered, and slipped away among the trees. He followed the footpath along the low bank of the stream, and then crossed at a shallow place, stepping lightly over the exposed rocks. The high diamond mesh security fence was on the opposite bank, and he squatted below it. He didn't have to wait long. Within seconds, a wolf-like shape appeared out of the darkness beyond the fence, and the moment it saw him, the German shepherd rushed at him, hurling itself against the heavy gauge wire fence. Hey, Prince, Sean said quietly, leaning toward the animal, showing not the least sign of fear. Come on, boy, you know me. The dog recognized him at last. It had only barked once, not creating enough of an uproar to alert the household. And now Sean gently pushed his fingers through the diamond mesh, talking softly and soothingly. The dog sniffed his hand, and its long tail began to wave back and forth in friendly salutation. Sean had a way with all living creatures, not only humans. The dog licked his fingers. Sean whistled softly, and Rufus scrambled up the bank behind him. Immediately the German shepherd stiffened, and the hair on its back became erect. It growled throatily, and Sean whispered, Don't be a fool, Prince. Rufus is a friend. It took another five minutes for Sean to introduce the two of them, but at last, in response to Sean's urging, Rufus gingerly put his fingers through the mesh, and the dog sniffed them carefully and wagged his tail. I'll go over first. Sean said, and swarmed up the high fence. There were three strands of barbed wire at the top, but Sean flicked his body over, feet first, arching his back like a gymnast. He dropped lightly to earth, and the dog rose on its hind legs and placed its front paws on his chest. Sean fondled his head, holding him while Rufus came over the barbed wire with even greater agility than Sean had. Let's go, Sean whispered. And with the guard dog padding along beside them, they went up towards the house, crouching as they ran and keeping to the shadow of the ornamental shrubs until they flattened against the wall, shrinking into the leafy ivy that covered the brickwork. The house was a double storied mansion, almost as imposing as Velta Frieden. It belonged to another leading Cape family, close friends of the Courtney's. Mark Weston had been at school with Shaza and in the same engineering class at university. His wife, Marjorie, was a contemporary of Tara Courtney's. They had two teenage daughters, the elder of which Sean had deprived of her virginity the previous year, and then dropped without another phone call. The 17-year-old child had suffered a nervous breakdown, refusing to eat, threatening suicide and weeping endlessly until she had to be taken out of school. Marjorie Weston had sent for Sean to try to remonstrate with him and persuade him to let her daughter down gently. She had arranged the meeting without her daughter's knowledge, and while her husband was on one of his regular business trips to Johannesburg. She took Sean to her sewing room on the ground floor and locked the door. It was Thursday afternoon, the servant's day off, and her younger daughter was at school, while the eldest, Veronica, was in her bedroom upstairs, palely pining. Marjorie patted the sofa. Please come and sit next to me, Sean. She was determined to keep the interview friendly. It was only when he was beside her that Marjorie realised how infernally good-looking he was, even more so than his father, and Marjorie had always had a strong fancy for Shaza Courtney. She found that she was becoming a little breathless as she reasoned with Sean, but it was only when she placed her hand on his bare arm and felt the elastic muscle under the smooth young skin that she realised what was happening. 
Sean had the philanderer's sure and certain instinct. Perhaps he had inherited it from his father. He hadn't really thought about Veronica's mother that way. God, she was as old as his mother. However, since Claire East, he had always had a taste for older women, and Marjorie Weston was slim and athletic from swimming and tennis, and meticulously tanned to disguise the crow's feet at the corners of her eyes, and the first signs of creping at her throat. And where Veronica was vacuous and simpering, her mother was poised and mature, but with the same mauve blue eyes that had first attracted him to the daughter, and an even more carefully groomed mane of thick, tawny hair. As Sean became aware of her excitement, the flush of blood beneath her tan, the agitated breathing that made her bosom beneath her angora jersey and pearls work like a bellows, and the subtle change in her body odour that the average male would not have noticed, but which to Sean was like an invitation on an embossed card, he found his own arousal was spiced by the perversity of the situation. A double, he thought. Mother and daughter. Now that's something different. He didn't have to plot further. He let his infallible instinct guide him. You're much more attractive than your daughters could ever be. The main reason I broke off with Ronnie was I just couldn't bear being near you without being able to do this. And he leaned over her and kissed her with an open mouth. Marjorie had believed herself to be in complete control of the situation right up until the moment she tasted his mouth. Neither of them spoke again until he was kneeling in front of her, holding her knees apart with both hands, and she was sprawled across the sofa with her pleated skirt rucked up around her waist. Then she panted brokenly. Oh, Christ, I just can't believe this is happening. I must be crazy. Now she sat at the foot of the stairs in her satin bathrobe. She was naked under the robe, and every few seconds she shivered in a brief spasm. The night was warm, and the house was in darkness. The girls were asleep upstairs, and Mark was away on one of his regular business trips. This was the first chance at an assignation there had been in almost two weeks, and she was shivering with anticipation. She had switched off the burglar alarms at nine o'clock, as they had arranged. Sean was almost half an hour late. Perhaps something had happened, and he wasn't coming after all. She hugged herself and shivered miserably at the thought. Then she heard the light tap on the glass of the French windows leading onto the swimming pool patio, and she leapt to her feet and raced across the darkened room. She found she was panting as she fumbled with the latch. Sean stepped into the room and seized her. He was so tall and powerful that she turned to putty in his arms. No man had ever kissed her like this, so masterfully and yet so skillfully. She sometimes wondered who had taught him, and then was consumed by jealousy at the thought. Her need of him was so intense that waves of giddy vertigo washed over her, and without his arms to support her, she was certain she would have sagged to the floor. Then he tugged at the knot that secured the belt of her robe. It came undone, and he thrust his hand into the opening. She shifted her weight, setting her feet wider apart so he could reach her more easily, and she gave a stifled gasp as she felt him slip his forefinger into her, and she pushed hard against his hand. Lovely, Sean chuckled in her ear, like the Zambezi River in flood. Shh, she whispered, you awake the girls. Marjorie liked to think of herself as genteel and refined, yet his crude words increased her excitation to a fever. Lock the door, she ordered him, her voice thick and shaking. Let's go upstairs. He released her and turned to the door. He pressed it closed until the catch snapped and then turned the key and in the same instant reversed the movement, leaving it unlocked. All right. He turned back to Marjorie. All set. They kissed again and she ran her hands frantically down the front of his body, feeling the throbbing hardness through the thin cloth. It was she who broke away at last. Oh, God, I can't wait any longer. She took his hand and dragged him up the marble staircase. The girls' bedrooms were in the east wing, and Marjorie locked the heavy mahogany door that secured the master suite. They were safe from discovery here, and at last she could let herself go completely. Marjorie Weston had been married for over twenty years, and she had taken about the same number of lovers in that time. Some of them had merely been mad one-night frolics 
Others had been longer, more permanent liaisons. One had lasted for almost all these twenty years. An erratic on-and-off arrangement, passionate interludes interspersed with long periods of denial. However, none of her other lovers had been able to match the stripling in beauty and performance, in physical endurance and in devilish inventiveness. Not even Shaza Courtney, who was that other long-term lover. The son had the same intuitive understanding of her needs. He knew when to be rough and cruel, and when to be loving and gentle. But in other ways he outstripped his father. She had never been able to exhaust him, or even to force him to falter. And he had a streak of genuine brutality, an inherent evil in him that could terrify her at times. Added to that was the almost incestuous delight of taking the son after having had the father. Tonight Sean did not disappoint her. While she was driving hard towards her first climax of the evening, he suddenly reached out to the bedside table and lifted the telephone receiver. Ring your husband, he ordered, and thrust the instrument into her hand. God, are you mad? she gasped. What would I say to him? Do it, he said, and she realised that if she refused, he would slap her across the face. He had done that before. Still holding him between her thighs, she twisted awkwardly and dialed the Carlton Hotel in Johannesburg. When the hotel operator answered, she said, I wish to speak to Mr. Mark Weston in Suite 1750. You're going through, the operator said, and Mark answered on the third ring. Hello, darling, Marjorie said, and above her, Sean began to move again. I, I couldn't sleep, so I thought I'd ring you. Sorry if I woke you. It became a contest with Sean trying to force her to gasp or cry out while she attempted to maintain a casual conversation with Mark. When he succeeded and she gave a little involuntary squeal, Mark asked sharply, What was that? Oh, I, I made myself a cup of Milo and it was too hot. I burnt my lip. She could see how it was exciting Sean also. His face was no longer beautiful but swollen and flushed so that his features seemed coarsened. And in her she felt him swell and harden, filling her to bursting point, until she could control herself no longer, and she broke off the telephone conversation abruptly. Good night, Mark. Sleep well. And slammed the receiver down on its cradle, just as the first scream came bursting up her throat. Afterwards they lay still, both of them regaining their breath. But when he tried to roll off her, she tightened the grip of her legs and held him hard. She knew that if she could keep him from sliding out, within minutes he would be ready again. Outside on the front lawn, the dog barked once. Is someone there? she asked. No, Prince is just being naughty, Sean murmured. But he was listening intently, even though he knew that Rufus was too good to be heard, and they had planned every detail with care. Both he and Rufus knew exactly what they were after. Were after. After, 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 after. To commemorate the first month of their affair, Marjorie had bought Sean a set of Victorian dress studs and links in platinum and onyx and diamonds. She had invited him up to the house on a Thursday afternoon and led him through to Mark Weston's panelled study on the ground floor. While Sean watched, she checked the combination of the wall safe, which was discreetly engraved on the corner of the silver-framed photograph of herself and the girls, on Mark's desk, and then she had swung aside the false front of the section of the bookcase that concealed the safe and tumbled the combination of the lock. She left the safe door ajar when she brought the gift to him. Sean had demonstrated his gratitude by pulling her skirts up and her peach-coloured satin bloomers down. Then, sitting her on the edge of her husband's desk, he lifted her knees and placed her feet on each corner of the leather-bound blotter. Then, while he stood in front of her and made love to her, he evaluated the contents of the safe over her shoulders. Sean had heard his father talk about Mark Weston's collection of British and South African gold coins. It was apparently one of the ten most important in private hands anywhere in the world. In addition to the dozen thick leather-bound albums which contained the collection, the middle shelf of the safe held the ledgers and cash books for the running of the estate and household, and a small gentleman's jewel box, while the top shelf was crammed with wads of pristine banknotes still in the bank wrappers and a large canvas bag stenciled Standard Bank Limited, which obviously contained silver. 
there could not have been less than £5,000 in notes and coins in the safe. Sean had explained to Rufus exactly where to look for the safe combination, how to open the false front of the bookcase and what to expect when he did. The knowledge that Rufus was at work downstairs and the danger of possible discovery stimulated Sean so that at one point Marjorie blurted, You aren't human, you're a machine. He left her at last, lying in the big bed like a wax doll that had melted in the sun, her limbs soft and plastic, the thick mane of hair darkened and sodden with her own sweat, and her mouth smeared out of shape by exhausted passions. Her sleep was catatonic. Sean was still pent up and excited. He looked into Mark Weston's study on the way out. The front of the bookcase was open, the safe door wide, the ledgers and cash books tumbled untidily on the floor, and the excitement came on him again in a thick, musky wave, and he found he was once more fully tumescent. It was dangerous to remain in the house another minute, and the knowledge made his arousal unbearable. He looked up the marble staircase again, and only then did the idea come to him. Veronica's room was the second door down the east wing passage. She might scream if he woke her suddenly. She might hate him so that she would scream when she recognised him, but on the other hand, she might not. The risk was lunatic, and Sean grinned in the darkness and started back up the marble staircase. A silver blade of moonlight pierced the curtains and fell on Veronica's pale hair that swirled across the pillow. Sean leaned over her and covered her mouth with his hand. She came awake, struggling and terrified. It's me, he whispered. Don't be afraid, Ronnie, it's me. Her struggle stilled. The fear faded from her huge mauve eyes, and she reached up for him with both arms. He lifted his hand off her mouth, and she said, Oh, Sean, deep down I knew it. I knew you still loved me. Rufus was furious. I thought you'd been caught, he whined. What happened to you, man? I was doing the hard work. Sean kicked the Harley Davidson, and it roared into life. As he turned back onto the road, he felt the weight of the saddlebags pull the machine off balance. But he met her easily and straightened up. Slow down, man. Rufus leaned forward from the pillion to caution him. You'll wake the whole valley. And Sean laughed in the wild rush of wind, drunk with excitement, and they went up over the crest at a hundred miles an hour. Sean parked the Harley Davidson on the Cryfontaine Road, and they scrambled down the bank and squatted in the dry culvert beneath the road. By the light of an electric torch, they shared the booty. You said there'd be five grand, Rufus whined accusingly. Man, there isn't more than a hundred. Old man Weston must have paid his slaves, Sean chuckled carelessly as he split the small bundle of banknotes and pushed the larger pile towards Rufus. You need it more than me, kid. The jewel box contained cufflinks and studs, a diamond tie pin that Sean judged to be fully five carats in weight, Masonic medallions, Mark Weston's miniature decorations on a bar, he had won an MC at El Alamein and a string of campaign medals, a Patek Philippe dress watch in gold, and a handful of other personal items. Rufus ran over them with an experienced eye. The watch is engraved. All the other stuff is too hot to move, too dangerous, man. We'll have to dump it. They opened the coin albums. Five of them were filled with sovereigns. OK, Rufus grunted. I can move that small stuff, but not these. They're red hot. They'll burn your fingers. With scorn, he discarded the albums of heavy coins, the five pound and five guinea issues of Victoria and Elizabeth, Charles and the Georges. After he dropped Rufus off at the illicit Shabine in the coloured District 6, where Rufus had parked his own motorcycle, Sean rode out along the high winding road that skirts the sheer massif of Chapman's Peak. He parked the Harley on the edge of the cliff. The Green Atlantic crashed against the rock 500 feet below where he stood. One at a time, Sean hurled the heavy gold coins out over the edge. He flicked them underhanded, so that they caught the dawn's uncertain light and then were lost in the shadows of the cliff face as they fell, so he could not see them strike the surface of the water far below. When the last coin was gone, he tossed the empty albums after them, and they fluttered as they caught the wind. Then he flung the gold wristwatch 
and the diamond pin out into the void. He kept the medals for last. It gave him a vindictive satisfaction to have screwed Mark Weston's wife and daughter, and then to throw his medals into the sea. When he mounted the Harley Davidson and turned it back down the steep winding road, he pushed the goggles up onto his forehead and let the wind beat into his face and rake his eyes so that the tears streamed back across his cheeks. He rode hard, putting the glistening machine over as he went into the turns so that the footrest struck a shower of sparks from the road surface. Not much profit for a night's work, he told himself, and the wind tore the words from his lips. But the thrills, oh, the thrills... When all his best efforts to interest Sean and Michael in the planetary system of the Courtney companies had resulted in either lukewarm and deviously feigned enthusiasm or in outright disinterest, Shaza had gone through a series of emotions, beginning with puzzlement. He tried hard to see how anyone, particularly a young man of superior intellect, and even more particularly a son of his, could find the whole complex interlinking of wealth and opportunity, of challenge and reward, less than fascinating. At first he thought that he was to blame, that he had not explained it sufficiently, that he had somehow taken their response for granted and had, through his own omissions, failed to quicken their attention. To Shaza, it was the very stuff of life itself. His first waking thought each morning and his last before sleep each night was for the welfare and sustenance of the company. So he tried again more patiently, more exhaustively. It was like trying to explain colour to a blind man, and from puzzlement, Shaza found himself becoming angry. Damn it, Mater! he exploded when he and Santan were alone at her favourite place on the hillside above the Atlantic. They just don't seem to care. What about Gary? Santan asked quietly. Oh, Gary! Shaza chuckled disparagingly. Every time I turn around, I trip over him. He's like a puppy. I see you have given him his own office on the third floor, Santan observed mildly. The old broom cupboard, Shaza said. It was a joke, really, but the little blighter took it seriously. I just didn't have the heart. He takes most things seriously, does your young Garrick, Santan observed. He's the only one who does. He's quite a deep one. Oh, come on, Mater. Gary? He and I had a long chat the other day. Uh, you should do the same. It might surprise you. Did you know that he is in the top three in his year? Yes, of course I knew, but I mean... It's only his first year of business administration. One doesn't take that too seriously. Doesn't one? Santan asked innocently, and Shaza was unusually silent for the next few minutes. The following Friday, Shaza looked into the cubbyhole at the end of the passage, which served as Gary's office when he was temporarily employed by Courtney Mining during his college vacations. Gary leapt dutifully to his feet when he recognised his father, and he pushed his spectacles up onto the bridge of his nose. Hello, champ, what are you up to? Shaza asked, glancing down at the forms that covered the desk. It's a control, Gary was caught in a crossfire, or at his father's sudden interest in what he was doing and desperation to retain his attention and to obtain his approval. Did you know that we spent over a hundred pounds on stationery last month alone? He was so anxious to impress his father that he stuttered again, something he only did when he was overexcited. Take a deep breath, champ. Shaza eased into the tiny room. There was just room for the two of them. Speak slowly and tell me about it. One of Gary's official duties was to order and issue the office stationery. The shelves behind his desk were filled with sheaves of typing paper and boxes of envelopes. According to my estimates, we should be able to cut that below £80. We could save £20 a month. Show me, Shaza perched on the corner of the desk and applied his mind to the problem. He treated it with as much respect as if they were discussing the development of a new gold mine. Mm, you're quite right, Shaza approved his figures. You have full authority to put your new control system into practice. Shaza stood up. Well done, he said, and Gary glowed with gratification. Shaza turned to the door so the lad wouldn't see his expression of amusement, and then he paused and looked back. Oh, by the way, I'm flying up to Volvus Bay tomorrow. I'm meeting the architects and the engineers on site to discuss the extensions to the canning factory. Would you like to come along? Unable to trust his voice, lest he stutter again, Gary nodded emphatically. 
Shahza allowed Gary to fly. Gary had been granted his private pilot's licence two months previously, but he still needed a few hours for his twin-engine endorsement. A year older than Gary, Sean had been given his licence immediately he was eligible. Sean flew the way he rode and shot, naturally, gracefully, but carelessly. He was one of those pilots who flew by the grace of God and the seat of his pants. In contrast, Gary was painstaking and meticulous, and therefore, Shahza admitted grudgingly, the better pilot. Gary filed a flight plan as though he was submitting a thesis for his doctorate, and his pre-flight checks went on so long that Shahza squirmed in the right-hand seat and only just contained himself from crying out, For God's sake, Gary, let's get on with it. Yet it was a mark of his trust that he allowed Gary to take the controls of the mosquito at all. Shahza was prepared to take over at the first sign of trouble, but he was amply rewarded for his forbearance when he saw the sparkle of deep pleasure behind Gary's spectacles as he handled the lovely machine, lifting her up through the silver wreaths of cloud into a blue African sky, where Shahza could share with him a rare feeling of total accord. Once they arrived at Volfus Bay, Shahza tended to forget that Gary was with him. He had become accustomed to his middle son's close attendance, and though he did not really think of it, it was becoming familiar and comforting to have him there. Gary seemed to anticipate his smallest need, whether it was a light for his cigarette or a piece of scrap paper and a pencil on which to illustrate an idea to the architect. Yet Gary was quiet and unobtrusive, not given to inane questions and bumptious or facetious remarks. The cannery was fast becoming one of the big winners in the Courtney stable of companies. For three seasons they had captured their full quota of pilchards, and then there had been an unusual development. In a private meeting, Manfred de la Rey had suggested to Shaza that if the company were to issue a further 10,000 bonus shares in the name of a nominee in Pretoria, the consequences might be very much to everybody's advantage. Taking Manfred on trust, Shaza had issued the shares as suggested, and within two months there had been a review of their quota by the Government Department of Land and Fisheries, and that quota had been almost doubled to the 200,000 tonnes of pilchard that they were now permitted to capture annually. For 300 years the Afrikaners have been left out of business, Shaza smiled cynically as he received the glad tidings. But they're catching on fast. They are now in a race and not too fussy about how they win. The Jews and the English had better look out to their business laurels. Here come the gnats. And he set about planning and financing the extension to the cannery. It was late afternoon before Shaza finished with the architects, but at this season there was still a few hours of daylight remaining. How about a swim at Pelican Point? Shaza suggested to Gary, and they took one of the cannery land rovers and drove along the hard wet sand at the edge of the bay. The waters of the bay stank of sulphur and fish offal, but behind it the high golden dunes and arid mountains rose in desolate grandeur, while out over the protected and silken waters the flamingo flocks were such a brilliant pink as to seem improbable and theatrical. Shaza drove fast around the curve of the bay, with the wind ruffling their hair. 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 So, what, if anything, did you learn today? I learned that if you want other people to talk too freely, you keep quiet and look sceptical, Gary answered, and Shaza glanced at his son with a startled expression. That had always been a deliberate technique of his, but Shaza had never expected anyone so young and inexperienced to see through it. Without saying anything, you made the architect admit that he really hasn't worked out a solution to sighting the boiler room yet, Gary went on, and even I could see that his present proposal is an expensive compromise. Is that so? It had taken Shaza a full day of discussion to reach the same conclusion, but he wasn't going to say so. Well, what would you do, then? I don't know, Peter, not for sure, Gary said. He had a pedantic manner of delivering an opinion, which had at first irritated Shaza, but which now amused him, particularly as the opinions were usually worth listening to. But instead of simply sticking on another boiler, I would explore the possibility of installing the new Patterson process. What do you know about the Patterson process, Shaza demanded sharply. He had only heard about it himself very recently. Suddenly, Shaza found himself arguing as though with an equal. 
Gary had read all the sales pamphlets and memorised the specifications and figures of the process, and had worked out for himself most of the advantages and disadvantages over the conventional method of preparation and canning. They were still arguing as they rounded the sandy horn of the bay, and beyond the lighthouse the deserted beach, clean and white, stretched away in dwindling perspective to the horizon. Here the Atlantic waters were wild and green, cold and clean, foamy and effervescent with the rush of the surf. They stripped off their clothes and naked swam out into the tumultuous seas, diving deep beneath each curling wave as it came hissing down upon them. At last they emerged, their bodies tinted blue with the cold, but laughing breathlessly with exhilaration. As they stood beside the Land Rover and toweled themselves, Shaza studied his son frankly. Even though sodden with salt water, Gary's hair stuck up in disorderly spikes, and without his spectacles he had a bemused, myopic look. His torso was massively developed, his chest was like a pickle barrel, and he had grown such a coat of dark body hair that it almost obscured the ridges of muscle that covered his belly like chain mail. Looking at him, there is no way you would ever suspect that he was a Courtney. If I didn't know better, I'd think that Tara had a little fling on the side. Shaza was certain that Tara might be capable of many things, but never infidelity or promiscuity. There's nothing about him of his ancestry, he thought, and then looked further and grinned suddenly. Well, at least, Gary, you've inherited one of the Courtney gifts. You've got a wanger on you that would make old General Courtney himself turn in his grave with envy. Hurriedly, Gary covered himself with his towel and reached into the Land Rover for his underpants, but secretly he was pleased. Up until now, he had always regarded that portion of his anatomy with suspicion. It seemed to be an alien creature with a will and existence of its own, determined to embarrass and humiliate him at the most unexpected or inappropriate moments. Like that unforgettable occasion when he was standing in front of the commerce class at business school, giving his dissertation, and the girls in the front row started giggling. Or when he was forced to retreat in confusion from the typing pool at Santon House because of the alien's sudden but very apparent interest in the surroundings. However, if his father spoke respectfully of it, and the shade of the legendary general approved, then Gary was prepared to reconsider his own relationship with it and come to terms. They flew on to the Hani mine the next morning. All three of the boys had done their stint at the Hani, as indeed had Shaza so many years before. They had been required to work their way through every part of the mine's operation, from the drilling and blasting in the deep amphitheatre of the open pit to the final separation rooms where at last the precious crystals were recovered from the crushed blue ground. That forced labour had been more than sufficient for both Sean and Michael, and neither of them had ever shown the least desire to return to the Hani mine again. Gary was the exception. He seemed to have developed the same love for these remote wild hills as both Shaza and Santon shared. He asked to accompany his father here whenever Shaza's regular inspection tours were scheduled. In a few short years, he had built up an expert knowledge of the mine's operation, and had at one time or another personally performed all of the tasks involved in the process of production. So, on their last evening at the mine, the two of them, Shaza and Gary, stood on the brink of the great pit, and while the sun set over the desert behind them, they stared down into its shadowy depths. It's strange to think that it all came out of there, Gary said softly. Everything that you and Nana have built up, it makes one feel somehow humble, like when I'm in church. He was silent for a long moment and then went on. I love this place. I wish we could stay longer. To hear his own feeling echoed like this moved Shaza deeply. Of his three sons, this was the only one who understood, who seemed capable of sharing with him the almost religious awe that this massive excavation and the wealth it produced evoked in him. This was the fountainhead, and only Gary had recognised it. He placed his arm around Gary's shoulders and tried to find words, but after a moment he simply said, I know how you feel, champ. But we have to get back home. I have to introduce my budget to the house on Monday. It was not what he had wanted to say, but he sensed that Gary knew that, and as they picked their way down the rough pathway in the dusk, 
they were closer in spirit than they had ever been. The budget for Shaza's Ministry of Mines and Industry had been almost doubled this year, and he knew that the opposition were planning to give it a rough passage. They had never forgiven him for changing parties, so he was on his mettle as he rose to his feet and sought the Speaker's recognition, and then instinctively glanced up at the galleries. Santan was in the middle of the front row of the visitors' gallery. She was always there when she knew that either Shaza or Blaine was going to speak. She wore a small flat hat tilted forward over her eyes with a single yellow bird of paradise feather raked back at a jaunty angle, and she smiled and nodded encouragement as their eyes met. Beside Santan sat Tara. Now that was unusual. He couldn't remember when last she had come to listen to him. Our bargain doesn't include torture by boredom, she had told him. But there she was, looking surprisingly elegant, in a dainty straw basher, with a trailing pink ribbon around the crown and elbow-length white gloves. She touched the brim in a mocking salute, and Shaza lifted an eyebrow at her, and then turned to the press gallery high above the speaker's throne. The political correspondents from the English-speaking press were all there, pencils poised eagerly. Shaza was one of their favourite prey, but all their attacks seemed only to consolidate his position in the National Party, and by their pettiness and subjectivity point out the efficiency and effectiveness with which he ran his ministry. He loved the rough and tumble of parliamentary debate, and his single eye sparkled with battle lust as he took up his familiar slouch, both hands in his pockets, and launched into his presentation. They were at him immediately, yapping and snapping at his heels, interjecting with expressions of disbelief and outrage, calling out, Shame on you, sir, and scandal! And Shaza's grin infuriated them and goaded them to excesses, which he brushed aside with casual contempt, holding his own easily, and then gradually overwhelming them and turning their own ridicule back upon them, while around him his colleagues grinned with admiration and encouraged his more devastating sallies with cries of, Hoor, hoor! Yeah, yeah. When the division was called, his party backed him solidly, and his budget was approved by the expected majority. It was a performance which had enhanced his stature and standing. He was no longer the junior member of the cabinet, and Dr. Favut passed him a note. I was right to keep you on the team. Well done. In the front of the visitors' gallery, Santon caught his eye and clasped both hands together in a boxer's victory flourish. Yet somehow she made the gesture appear at once regal and ladylike. Shaza's smile faded as he realised that beside her Tara's seat was empty. She had left during the debate, and Shaza was surprised by his own feeling of disappointment. He would have liked her to witness his triumph. The house was moving on to other business, which did not concern him, and on an impulse Shaza rose and left the chamber. He went up the wide staircase and down the long panelled passageway to his office suite. As he approached the front entrance to the suite, he checked suddenly and again on impulse turned at the corner of the passage and went down to the unobtrusive and unmarked doorway at the end. This was the back door to his office, a convenient escape route from unwanted visitors which had been ordered by old Cecil John Rhodes himself as a bypass of the front waiting room, a means for special visitors to reach him and leave again unobserved. Shaza found it equally convenient. The Prime Minister used it occasionally, as did Manfred de la Rey, but the majority of other users were female, and their business with Shaza was seldom political. Instead of rattling the key in the Yale lock, Shaza slipped it in silently and turned it gently, then pushed the door open sharply. On the inside, the door was artfully blended into the panelling of his office, and few people knew of its existence. Tara was standing with her back towards him, bending over the altar chest. She did not know the door existed, except for the gift of the chest. She had taken little interest in the decoration and furbishment of his office. It was a few seconds before she sensed that she was not alone, and then her reaction was extravagant. She jumped back from the chest and whirled to face him, and as she recognised Shaza, instead of showing relief, she paled with agitation and began to explain breathlessly, I was just looking at it, it's such a magnificent piece of work, quite beautiful, I'd forgotten how beautiful. 
One thing Shaza realised immediately. She was as guilty as if she had been caught red-handed in some dreadful crime. But he could not imagine what had made her react that way. She was quite entitled to be in his office. She had her own key to the front door. And she had given him the chest. She could admire it whenever she chose. He remained silent and fastened his eye upon her accusingly, hoping to trick her into over-explaining. But she left the chest and moved across to the window behind his desk. You were doing very well on the floor, she said. She was still a little breathless, but her colour had returned and she was recovering her composure. You always put on such a good show. Is that why you left? he asked, as he closed the door and pointedly crossed the room to the chest. Oh, you know how useless I am with figures. You quite lost me towards the end. Shaza studied the chest carefully. What was she up to? he asked himself thoughtfully. But he could not see that anything was altered. The Van Vaux bronze sculpture of the Bushman was still in its place, so she could not have opened the lid. It's a marvellous piece, he said, and stroked the effigy of St Luke at the corner. I had no idea there was a door in the panel. Clearly Tara was trying to distract his attention from the chest, and her efforts merely piqued his curiosity. You gave me quite a turn. Shaza refused to be led, and ran his fingers over the inlaid lid. I should get Dr Findlay from the National Gallery to have a look at it, Shaza mused. He's an expert on medieval and Renaissance religious art. Oh, I promised Trisha I would let her know when you arrived. Tara sounded almost desperate. She's got an important message for you. She crossed quickly to the interleading door and opened it. Trisha, Mr Courtney's here now. Shaza's secretary popped her head into the inner office. Do you know a Colonel Louis Nell? she asked. He's been trying to get hold of you all morning. Nell? Shaza was still studying the chest. Nell? No, 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 I don't think so. He says he knows you, sir. He says you worked together during the war. Oh, good Lord, yes. She had Shaza's full attention now. It was so long ago, but yes, I know him well. Uh, he wasn't a colonel then. He's head of CID for the Cape of Good Hope now, Trisha told him, and he wants you to telephone him as soon as you can. Uh, he says it's very urgent. He actually said life and death. Life and death, hey? Shaza grinned. That probably means he wants to borrow money. Get him on the blower, please, Trish. He went to his desk, sat down and pulled the telephone towards him. He motioned Tara towards the couch, but she shook her head. I'm meeting Sally and Jenny for lunch and she sidled towards the door with a relieved expression. But he wasn't looking at her. He was staring out of the window over the oaks to the slopes of Signal Hill beyond, and he didn't even glance round as she slipped out of the room and closed the door quietly behind her. Louis Nell's call had transported Shaza back almost twenty years in time. Was it that long ago, he wondered? Yes, it was. My God, how quickly the years have passed. Shaza had been a young squadron leader, invalided back from the campaign in Abyssinia, where he had lost his eye fighting the Duke of Aosta's army on the drive up to Addis Ababa. At a loose end, certain that his life was ruined, and that he was a cripple and a burden on his family and friends, Shaza had gone into seclusion and started drinking heavily, and letting himself slip into careless despondency. It had been Blaine Malcolm S. who had sought him out, and given him a scornful and painful tongue lashing, and then offered him a job helping track down and break up the Osovar Brandwach, the sentinels of the wagon train, a secret society of militant nationalist Afrikaners who were virulently opposed to Field Marshal Jan Christian Smuts's pro-British war efforts. Shaza had worked in cooperation with Louis Nell, establishing the identity of the leading members of the pro-Nazi conspiracy and preparing the warrants for their arrest and internment. His investigations of the Osovar Brandwach's activities had put him in contact with a mysterious informer, a woman who had contacted him only by telephone and who took every precaution to conceal her identity. To this day, Shaza did not know who she had been, or indeed if she was still alive. This informer had revealed to him the OB theft of weapons from the government arms and munitions factory in Pretoria and enabled them to deal a major blow to the subversive organisation. Then the same informer had warned Shaza of the White Sword conspiracy. 
This was an audacious plot to assassinate Field Marshal Smuts, and in the ensuing confusion to seize control of the armed forces, declare South Africa a republic, and throw in their lot with Adolf Hitler and the Axis powers. Shaza had been able to foil the plot at the very last minute, but only by the most desperate efforts and at the cost of his own grandfather's life. Sir Garrick Courtney had been shot by the assassin in mistaken identity, for the old man had physically resembled his good and dear friend, Field Marshal Smuts. Shaza had not thought about those dangerous days for many years. Now every detail came back vividly. He lived it all again as he waited for the telephone on his desk to ring. The reckless climb up the sheer side of Table Mountain as he tried to catch his grandfather and the field marshal before they could reach the summit where the killer was waiting for them. He recalled his dreadful sense of helplessness as the rifle shot crashed and echoed against the rocky cliffs and he realised he was too late. The horror of finding his grandfather lying in the track with the ghastly bullet wound which had blown his chest open and the old field marshal kneeling beside him, stricken with grief. Shaza had chased the killer, using his intimate knowledge of the mountain to cut off his retreat against the top of the cliff. They fought chest to chest, fought for their very lives. White Sword had used his superior strength to break away and escape, but not before Shaza had put a bullet from his 6.5mm Beretta into his chest. White Sword disappeared and the plot to overthrow Smuts's government collapsed. But the killer had never been brought to justice, and Shaza felt once again the agony of his grandfather's murder. He had loved the old man, and named his second son after him. The telephone rang at last, and Shaza snatched it up. Louis, he asked. Shaza! Shaza recognised his voice immediately. It's been a long time. Oh, it's good to speak to you. Yes, but I wish I was the bearer of better news. I'm sorry. What is it? Shaza was immediately serious. Uh, not on the telephone. Can you come down to Caledon Square as soon as possible? Ten minutes, Shaza said, and hung up. The headquarters of the CID were only a short walk from the House of Assembly, and he stepped it out briskly. The episode with Tara and the chest were put out of his mind as he tried to imagine what bad news Louis Nell had for him. The sergeant at the front desk had been alerted, and he recognised Shaza immediately. Uh, the colonel is uh, expecting you, minister. I'll send someone to show you up to his office. And he beckoned one of the uniformed constables. Louis Nell was in his shirt sleeves, and he came to the door to welcome Shaza and led him to one of the easy chairs. How about a drink? Still too early for me. Shaza shook his head, but he accepted the cigarette Louis offered him. The policeman was lean as ever, but he had lost most of his hair, and what remained was ice white. There were dark pouches beneath his eyes, and after his welcoming smile, his mouth settled back into a thin, nervous line. He looked like a man who worried a lot, worked too hard, and slept badly at night. He must be past retirement age, Shaza thought. How's the family? Your wife? Shaza asked. He had met her only once or twice and could not remember her name or what she looked like. Oh, uh, we were divorced five years ago. Oh, I'm sorry, Shaza said, and Louis shrugged. It was a bad time. Then he leaned forward. Your family? You have three boys and a girl, uh, that's right? Ah, you've been doing a police number on me, Shaza smiled. But Louis did not respond. His expression remained serious as he went on. Uh, your uh, eldest son, his name is Sean. That's right, isn't it? Shaza nodded. He was no longer smiling either, and he was seized by a sudden presentment. You want to speak to me about Sean? he asked softly. Louis stood up abruptly and crossed to the window. He was looking down into the street as he answered. 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 This is off the record, Shaza. Not the way we usually do things, but there are extraordinary factors here. Our past association, your present rank, he turned back from the window. In the usual circumstances, this would probably not have been brought to my notice at all, at least not at this stage of the investigation. The word investigation startled Shaza, and he wanted Louis to give him the bad news and get it over with, but he controlled his agitation and impatience and waited quietly. 
Uh, for some time now, we have been troubled by a series of housebreakings in the better-class suburbs. You have surely read about them. The press are calling the thief the Cape Raffles. Of course, Shaza nodded. Some of my friends, good friends, have been the victims. The Simpsons, the Westons. Mark Weston lost his collection of gold coins. And Mrs. Simpson lost her emeralds. Louis Nell agreed. Some of those emeralds, the earrings, uh, were recovered when we raided a fence in District 6. We were acting on a tip-off, and we recovered an enormous quantity of stolen articles. We arrested the fence. He's a coloured chappy who was running an electrical business in the front of his premises and receiving stolen goods through the back door. We have had him locked up for two weeks now, and he's beginning to cooperate. He gave us a list of names, and on it was one lovable little rogue named Rufus Constantine. Ever heard of him? Shaza shook his head. But how does this link up with my son? I'm coming to that. This Constantine was apparently the one who passed the emeralds and some of the other booty. We picked him up and brought him in for questioning. Well, he's a tough little monkey, but we found a way to open him up and make him sing to us. Unfortunately, the tune wasn't very pretty. Sean? Shaza asked, and Louis nodded. I'm afraid so. Looks as though he was the leader of an organised gang. It just doesn't make sense. Not Sean. Your son has built up quite a reputation. He was a little wild at one time, Shaza admitted, but he's settling down to his articles now, working hard, and why would he want to get involved in something like that? I mean, he doesn't need the money. Articled clerks are not paid a great fortune. I give him an allowance, Shaza shook his head again. No, I don't believe it. What would he know about housebreaking? Oh, no, he doesn't do it himself. He sets up the job, and Rufus and his henchmen do the dirty work. Sets it up? What do you mean by that? As a son of yours, he is welcome in any home in the city. That is right, isn't it? I suppose so, Shaza was cautious. According to little Rufus, your son studies each prospective victim's home, decides on what valuables there are, and pinpoints where they are kept. Strong rooms, hidden drawers, wall safes, and that sort of thing. Then he begins an affair with one of the family, the mother or a daughter, and uses his opportunities to let his accomplice into the home while he's entertaining the lady of his choice upstairs. Shaza stared at him wordlessly. By all accounts, it works very well, and in more than one case, the theft was not even reported to us. The ladies involved were more concerned with their reputations and their husbands' wrath than with the loss of their jewellery. Marge Weston, Charles asked. She was one of the ladies? According to our information, yes, she was. Shaza whispered, the little bastard. He was appalled and totally convinced. It all fitted too neatly not to be true. Marge and Sean, his son and one of his mistresses. It was just not to be tolerated. This time he's gone too far. Yes, Louis agreed. Too far by a mile. Even as a first offender, he'll probably get five or six years. All Shaza's attention snapped back to him. The shock of Shaza's pride and sense of propriety was such that he had not even begun to consider the legal implications. But now his righteous rage was snuffed out at the suggestion of his eldest son standing in the dock and being sentenced to long-term imprisonment. Have you prepared a docket yet? he asked. Is there a warrant out? Not yet, Louis was speaking as carefully. We were only given this information a few hours ago. He crossed to his desk and picked up the blue interrogation folder. What can I do? Shaza asked quietly. Is there anything we can do? I've done all I can, Louis answered. I've done too much already. I could never justify holding up this information, nor could I justify informing you of investigation in progress. I've already stretched my neck way out, Shaza. We go back a long way, and I'll never forget the work you did on White Sword. That's the only reason I took the chance. He paused to take a deep breath, and Shaza, sensing there was more to come, remained silent. There is nothing else I can do. Nothing else anyone can do at this level. He placed peculiar emphasis on the last three words, at this level. And then he added seemingly incongruously, I'm retiring next month. 
There'll be someone else in this office after that. How long do I have? Shanaza asked, and he did not have to elaborate. They understood each other. I can sit on this file for another few hours until five o'clock today, and then the investigation will have to go ahead. Shanaza stood up. You're a good friend. I'll walk you down, Louis said, and they were alone in the lift before they spoke again. It had taken Shaza that long to master his perturbation. I hadn't thought about White Sword for years. He changed the subject easily. Not until today. All that seemed so far away and long ago, even though it was my own grandfather. I've never forgotten it, Louis Nell said softly. The man was a murderer. If he had succeeded, if you hadn't prevented it, all of us in this land would be a lot worse off than we are today. I wonder what happened to White Sword. Who he was and where he is now? Oh, perhaps he's long dead. Perhaps, oh, I don't think so. There is something that makes me doubt it. A few years ago, I wanted to go over the White Sword file. The lift stopped at the ground floor, and Louis broke off. He remained silent as they crossed the lobby and went out into the sunlight. On the front steps of the headquarters building, they faced each other. Yes, Shaza asked. The file. The white sword file. There, there is no file, Louis said softly. I don't understand. No file, Louis repeated. Not in police records, or the Justice Department, or the Central Records. Officially, white sword never existed. Shaza stared at him. There must be a file. I mean, we worked on it. You and I. It, it, it was this thick. Shaza held his thumb and forefinger apart. It can't have disappeared. You can take my word for it. It has. Louis held out his hand. Five o'clock, he said gently. No later. But I will be in my office all day, right up to five, if anyone wanted to telephone me there. Shaza took his hand. I'll never forget this. He glanced at his wristwatch as he turned away. It was a few minutes before noon. And most fortuitously, he had a lunch date with Manfred de la Rey. He headed back up Parliament Lane, and the noonday gun fired just as he went through the main doors. Everybody in the main lobby, including the ushers, instinctively checked their watches at the distant clap of cannon shot. Shaza turned towards the members' dining room, but he was far too early. Except for the white uniformed waiters, it was deserted. In the members' bar, he ordered a pink gin. And waited impatiently, glancing every few seconds at his watch. But his appointment with Manfred was for twelve thirty, and it was no good going to search for him. He could be anywhere in the huge rambling building. So Shaza employed the time in cherishing and fanning his anger. The bastard, he thought. I've allowed him to fool me all these years. All the signs were there, but I refused to accept them. He's dirty, rotten, rotten right to the core. And then his indignation went off in a new direction. Arch Weston is old enough to be his mother. How many of my other women has he been boffing? Is nothing sacred to the little devil? Manfred de la Rey was a few minutes early. He came to the members' bar, smiling and nodding and shaking hands, playing the genial politician, so that it took him a few minutes to cross the room. Shaza could barely contain his impatience, but he didn't want anyone to suspect his agitation. Manfred asked for a beer. Shaza had never seen him take hard spirit, and only after he had taken his first sip did Shaza tell him quietly, "I'm in trouble, serious trouble." Manfred's easy smile never faltered; he was too shrewd to betray his emotions to a room full of adversaries and potential rivals. But his eyes went cold and pale as those of a basilisk. "Not here," he said, and led Shaza through to the men's room. They stood shoulder to shoulder at the urinal, and Shaza spoke softly but urgently. And when he finished, Manfred stood staring at the white ceramic trough for only a few seconds before he roused himself. What's the number? Shaza slipped him a card with Louis Nell's telephone number at CID headquarters. I'll have to use the security line from my office. Give me fifteen minutes. I'll meet you back at the bar. Manfred zipped his fly closed. And strode out of the lavatory. 
He was back in the members bar within ten minutes, by which time Shaza was entertaining the four other members of the luncheon party, all of them influential backbenchers. When they finished their drinks, Shaza suggested, Shall we go through? As they moved towards the dining room, Manfred took his upper arm in a firm grip and leaned close to him, smiling as though conveying a pleasantry. I've squashed it, but he is to be out of the country within 24 hours and I don't want him back. Is that a bargain? I'm grateful, Shaza nodded, and his anger at his son was compounded by this obligation that had been forced upon him. It was a debt that he would have to repay with interest. Sean's Harley was parked down at the sports hall that Shaza had built as a joint Christmas present for all three boys two years previously. It contained a gymnasium and squash court, half Olympic size indoor swimming pool and change rooms. As Shaza approached, he heard the explosive echo of the rubber ball from the courts and he went up to the spectators' gallery. Sean was playing with one of his cronies. He wore white silk shorts but his chest was bare. There was a white sweatband around his forehead and white tennis shoes on his feet. His body glistened with sweat and was tanned to a golden brown. He was impossibly beautiful, like a romantic painting of himself, and he moved with the unforced grace of a hunting leopard, driving the tiny ball against the high white wall with such deceptive power that it resounded like a fusillade of rifle fire as it rebounded. He saw Shaza in the gallery and flashed him a dazzle of even white teeth and green eyes, so that despite his anger, Shaza suffered a sudden pang at the idea of having to part from him. In the change room, Shaza dismissed his playing partner curtly. I want to speak to Sean, alone. And as soon as he was gone, he turned on his son. The police are on to you, he said. They know all about you. He waited for a reaction, but he was disappointed. Sean toweled his face and neck. Sorry, Pater, you've lost me there. What is it they know? He was cool and debonair, and Shaza exploded. Don't play your games with me, young man. What they know can put you behind bars for ten years. Sean lowered the towel and stood up from the bench. He was serious at last. How did they find out? Rufus Constantine. The little prick. I'll break his neck. He wasn't going to deny it, and Shaza's last hope that he was innocent faded. I'll break any necks that have to be broken, Shaza snapped. So what are we going to do? Sean asked, and Shaza was taken aback by his casual assumption. We? he asked. What makes you think I'm going to save your thieving hide? Family honour, Sean was matter of fact. You'll never let me go to court. The family would be on trial with me. You'd never allow that. That was part of your calculations, eh? Shaza asked. And when Sean shrugged, he added, You don't understand the words honour or decency. Words, Sean replied. Just words. I prefer actions. God, I wish I could prove you wrong, Shaza whispered. He was so furious now that he wanted the satisfaction of physical violence. I wish I could let you rot in some filthy cell. His fists were clenched, and before he thought about it, he shifted into balance for the first blow, and instantly Sean was on guard. His hands stiffening into blades crossed before his chest, and his eyes were fierce. Shaza had paid hundreds of pounds for his training by the finest instructors in Africa, and all of them had at last admitted that Sean was a natural fighter and that the pupil in each case outstripped the master. Delighted that Sean had at last found something that could hold his interest, Shaza had, before Sean began his articles, sent him to Japan for three months to study under a master of the martial arts. Now, as he confronted his son, Shaza was suddenly aware of every one of his 41 years, and that Sean was a man of full physical flower, a trained fighter and an athlete in perfect condition. He realised that Sean could toy with him and humiliate him. He could even read in Sean's expression that he was eager to do so. Shaza stepped back and unclenched his fists. Pack your bags, he said quietly. You are leaving and you are not coming back. They flew north in the Mosquito, landing only to refuel in Johannesburg and then flying on to Messina on the border with Rhodesia. 
Shaza had a 30% shareholding in the copper mine at Messina, so when he radioed ahead, there was a Ford pickup waiting for him at the airstrip. Sean tossed his suitcase into the back of the truck, and Shaza took the wheel. Shaza could have flown across the border to Salisbury or Lorenzo Marx, but he wanted the break to be clean and definite. Sean crossing a border on foot would be symbolic and salutary. As he drove the last few miles through the dry, hot bushveld to the bridge over the Limpopo River, Sean slumped down in the seat beside him, hands in his pockets and one foot on the dashboard. I've been thinking, he spoke in pleasant conversational tones. I've been thinking what I should do now, and I've decided to join one of the safari companies in Rhodesia or Kenya or Mozambique. Then when I've finished my apprenticeship, I'll apply for a hunting concession of my own. There's a fortune in it, and it must be the best life in the world. Imagine hunting every day. Shaza had determined to remain withdrawn and stern, and up until now he had succeeded in speaking barely a word since leaving Cape Town. But at last, Sean's total lack of remorse and his cheerful, selfish view of the future forced Shaza to abandon his good intentions. From what I hear, you wouldn't last a week without a woman, he snapped, and Sean smiled. Oh, don't worry about me, Pater. There'll be bags of jig-jig. That's part of the perks. The clients are old and rich, and they bring their daughters or their new young wives with them. My God, Sean, you are completely immoral. May I take that as a compliment, sir? Your plans to apply for your own hunting concession and to run your own safari company. What do you intend using in lieu of money? Sean looked puzzled. You're one of the richest men in Africa. Just think. Free hunting whenever you wanted, Pater. That would be part of our deal. Despite himself, Shaza felt a prickle of temptation. In fact, he had already considered starting a safari operation, and his estimates showed that Sean was correct. There was a fortune to be made in marketing the African wilderness and its unique wildlife. The only thing that had prevented him doing it before was that he had never found a trustworthy man who understood the special requirements of a safari company to run it for him. Damn it! He broke off that line of thought. I've spawned a devil's pup. He could sell a second-hand car to the judge who was passing the death sentence on him. He felt his anger softened by reluctant admiration, but he spoke grimly. You don't seem to understand, Sean. This is the end of the road for you and me. As he said it, they topped the rise. Ahead of them lay the Limpopo River. But despite Mr Rudyard Kipling, it was neither grey, green nor greasy, and there was not a single fever tree on either bank. This was the dry season, and though the river was half a mile wide, the flow was reduced to a thin trickle down the centre of the bed. The long, low concrete bridge stretched northwards across the orange-coloured sand and straggly clumps of reeds. They drove over the bridge in silence, and Shaza stopped the pickup at the barrier. The border post was a small square building with a corrugated iron roof. Shaza kept the engine of the Ford running. Sean climbed out and lifted his suitcase out of the back of the truck, then crossed in front of the bonnet and came to Shaza's open window. No, Dad. He leaned into the window. You and I will never reach the end of the road. I am part of you and I love you too deeply for that ever to happen. You are the only person or thing I have ever loved. Shaza studied his face for any trace of insincerity, and when he found none, he reached up impulsively and embraced him. He had not meant this to happen, had been determined that it would not but now he found himself reaching into the inside pocket of his jacket and bringing out the thick sheaf of banknotes and letters that he had carried with him despite his best intentions to turn Sean loose without a penny. Here are a couple of pounds to tide you over, he said, and his voice was gruff. And there are three letters of introduction to people in Salisbury who may be able to help you. Carelessly, Sean stuffed them into his pocket and picked up his suitcase. Thanks, Peter. I don't deserve it. No, Shazer agreed. You don't. But don't worry too much about it. There won't be any more. That's it, Sean. Finished. The first and only instalment of your inheritance. As always, Sean's smile was a little miracle. It made Shazer doubt, despite all the evidence, that his son was thoroughly bad. 
I'll write, Peter. You'll see one day we'll laugh about this, when we're together again. Lugging his suitcase, Sean passed through the barrier, and after he disappeared into the customs hut, Shaza was left with an unbearable sense of futility. Was this how it ended, after all the care and love, and over all those years? Shaza was amused by the ease with which Isabella was able to overcome her lisp. Within two weeks of enrolling at Rustenburg Girls' Senior School, she was talking and looking like a little lady. Apparently, the teachers and her fellow pupils had not been impressed by baby talk. It was only when she was trying to wheedle her father that she still employed the lisp and the pout. She sat on the arm of his chair now and stroked the silver wings of hair above Shaza's ears. I have the most beautiful daddy in the world, she crooned, and indeed the flashes of silver contrasted with the dense darkness of the rest of his hair and the tanned, almost unlined skin of his face to enhance Shaza's looks. I have the kindest and most loving daddy in the world. And I have the most scheming little vixen in the world for a daughter, he said, and she laughed with delight, a sound that made his heart contract and her breath in his face smelled milky and sweet as a newborn kitten. But he shored up his crumbling defences. I have a daughter who is only fourteen years old. Fifteen, she corrected him. Fourteen and a half, she countered. Almost fifteen, she insisted. A daughter under fifteen years of age who is much too precious to allow out of my house after ten o'clock at night. Oh, my big cuddly growly bear, she whispered in his ear and hugged him hard, and as she rubbed her soft cheek against his, her breasts pressed against his arm. Tara's breasts had always been large and shapely. He still found them immensely attractive. Isabella had inherited them from her. Over the last few months, Shaza had watched with pride and interest their phenomenal growth, and now they were firm and warm against his arm. "'Are there going to be boys there?' he asked and she sensed the first crack in his defence. Oh, I'm not interested in boys, Papa. And she shut her eyes tight in case a thunderbolt came crashing down on her for such a fib. These days Isabella could think of little else but boys. They even occupied her dreams, and her interest in their anatomy was so intense that both Michael and Gary had forbidden her to come into their rooms while they were changing. Her candid and fascinated examination was too disconcerting. How will you get there and back? You don't expect your mother to wait up until midnight, do you? And I'll be in Joburg that night. Stephen can take me and bring me back. Stephen? Shaza asked sharply. Mommy's new chauffeur. He's so nice and awfully trustworthy. Mommy says so. Shaza wasn't aware that Tara had taken on a chauffeur. She usually drove herself. But that reprehensible old Packard of hers had finally given up the ghost when she was away at Sunday and he had prevailed on her to accept a new Chevy station wagon. Presumably the chauffeur went with it. She should have consulted him, but they had drifted further and further apart over the last few years and seldom discussed domestic routine. No, he said firmly, I won't have you driving around on your own at night. But I'll be with Stephen, she pleaded. But he ignored the protest. He knew nothing about Stephen except that he was male and black. I'll tell you what. If you can get a written guarantee from one of the other girl's parents, somebody I know, that they will get you there and back before midnight, well, then, all right, you can go. Oh, Daddy, Daddy! She showered soft, warm kisses on his face and then leapt up and did a little victory pirouette around his study. She had long, willowy legs under the flaring skirt and a tight little bottom in lace panties. She is probably, he thought, and then corrected himself, she is without doubt the most beautiful child in the entire world. Isabella stopped suddenly and assumed a woebegone expression. Oh, papa, she cried in anguish. What is it now? Shaza leaned back in his swivel chair and hid his smile. Both Patty and Leonora are going to have new dresses and I shall look an awful frump. A frump forsooth. We cannot have that now, can we? And she rushed to him. "'Does that mean I may have a new dress, Daddy, darling?' "'She wound both arms around his neck again. 
The sound of a motor car coming up the drive interrupted their idyll. Here comes Mommy. Isabella sprang from his lap and, seizing his hand, dragged him to the window. We can tell her about the party and the dress now, can't we, darling Daddy? The new Chevrolet with the high tail fins and great chromed grille pulled up at the front steps and the new chauffeur stepped out. He was an imposing man, tall and broad-shouldered, in a dove-grey livery and cap with patent leather peak. He opened the rear door and Tara slipped out of her seat. As she passed him, she tapped the chauffeur on the arm, an over-friendly gesture so typical of Tara's treatment of the servants, which irritated Shaza as much as usual. Tara came up the front stairs and disappeared from Shaza's view, while the chauffeur went back into the driver's seat and pulled away towards the garages. As he drove below the windows of the study, he glanced up. His face was half obscured by the peak of his cap, but there was something vaguely familiar about his jawline and the way his head was set on that corded neck and those powerful shoulders. Shaza frowned, trying to place him, but the memory was an ancient one, or erroneous. And then behind him Isabella was calling in her special honeyed voice, Oh, Mummy, Daddy and I have something to tell you. And Shaza turned from the window, stealing himself for Tara's familiar accusation of favouritism and indulgence. The hidden door to Shaza's parliamentary suite of offices provided the key to the problem that they had been working on over the weeks that Moses Gama had been in Cape Town. It was simple enough for Moses to enter the Parliament building itself, dressed in chauffeur's livery and carrying an armful of shopping, shoeboxes and hat boxes, from the most expensive stores. He merely followed Tara as she swept past the doorman at the front entrance. There was virtually no security in operation, no register to sign, no lapel badges were necessary. A stranger might be asked to show a visitor's pass at the entrance, but as the wife of a cabinet minister, Tara merited a respectful salute, and she made a point of getting to know the doorman. Sometimes she paused to ask after a sick child, or the janitor's arthritis, and with her sunny personality and her concerned condescension, she was soon a favourite of the uniformed staff who guarded the entrance. She did not take Moses in with her on every occasion, only when she was certain that there was no risk of meeting Shaza. She brought him often enough to establish his presence and his right to be there. When they reached Shaza's suite, Tara would order him to place the parcels in the inner office while she paused to chat with Shaza's secretary. Then, when Moses emerged from the office empty-handed, she would dismiss him lightly. "'Thank you, Stephen. You may go down now. I'll need the car at eleven. Please bring it around to the front and wait for me.' Then Moses would walk down the main staircase, standing respectfully aside for parliamentary messengers and members and cabinet members. Once he had even passed the Prime Minister on the stairs, and he had to drop his gaze in case Favut recognised the hatred in his eyes. It gave him a weird feeling of unreality to pass only arm's length from the man who was the author of the people's misery, who more than any other represented all the forces of injustice and oppression, the man who had elevated racial discrimination to a quasi-religious philosophy. Moses found he was trembling as he went on down the stairs, but he passed the doorman without a glance, and the janitor in his cubicle barely lifted his eyes before concentrating once more on his newspaper. It was vital to Moses' plans that he should be able to leave the building unaccompanied, and constant repetition had made that possible. To the doorman he was almost invisible. However, they had still not solved the problem of access to Shaza's inner office. Moses might go in there long enough to deposit the armful of parcels, but he could not risk remaining longer. And especially he could not be in there behind a closed door or alone with Tara. Trisha, Shaza's secretary, was alert and observant, and obsessively loyal to Shaza. Like all Shaza's female employees, she was more than just a little in love with him. The discovery of the concealed rear door to the suite came as a blessing when they were almost desperately considering leaving the final preparation to Tara alone. Heavens, it was so simple after all our worrying, Tara laughed with relief, and the next time Shaza left for his inspection tour of the Hani mine, Taking Gary with him as usual, she and Moses made one of their visits to Parliament to test their arrangement. After Moses had left her parcels in the inner office 
and in front of Tricia, Tara sent him away. I won't need the car until much later, Stephen. I'm having lunch with my father in the dining room. Then, as he left, closing the outer door behind him, Tara turned back to Tricia. Uh, I have a few letters to write. Uh, I'll use my husband's office. Please see that I'm not disturbed. Tricia looked dubious. She knew that Shaza was fussy about his desk and the contents of his drawers, but she could not think of any way to prevent Tara making use of it. And while she hesitated, Tara marched into Shaza's office, closed the door and firmly locked it behind her. Another precedent had been set. On the outside, there was a light tap, and it took her a moment to discover the inside lock disguised as a light switch. She opened the panel door a crack. Moses slipped through it into the office. She held her breath against the snap of the lock and then turned eagerly to Moses. Both doors are locked, she whispered, and she embraced him. Oh, Moses, Moses, it's been so long. Even though they spent so much time in each other's company, the moments of total privacy were rare and precious, and she clung to him. Not now, he whispered. There is work to do. Reluctantly, she opened her embrace and let him go. He went to the window first, standing to one side as he drew the drapes, so that he could not be seen from outside, and then he switched on the desk lamp and removed his uniform jacket, hanging it on the back of Shaz's chair, before crossing to the altar chest. He paused before it, putting Tara in mind of a worshipper, for his head was bowed and his hands clasped before him reverently. Then he roused himself and lifted the heavy bronze Van Vau sculpture from the top of the chest. He carried it across the room and placed it on Shaza's desk. He went back and carefully opened the lid, wincing as the antique hinges squeaked. The interior of the chest had been half filled with the overflow from Shaza's bookshelves, piles of old copies of Hansard, out-of-date white papers and old parliamentary reports. Moses was annoyed at this unexpected obstacle. You must help me, he whispered to Tara, and between them they began to unpack the chest. Keep everything in the same order, Moses warned as he passed the piles of publications to her. We will have to leave it exactly as it was. The chest was so deep that at the end Moses found it easier to climb into it and pass the last of the contents out to her. The carpet was covered with stacks of paper now, but the chest was empty. Let me have the tools, Moses ordered. They were in one of the packets that Moses had carried up from the car, and she handed them to him. Don't make any noise, she pleaded. The chest was large enough to conceal him completely. She went to the door and listened for a moment. Trisha's typewriter was tapping away reassuringly. Then she went back to the chest and peered into it. Moses was on his knees working on the floor of the chest with a screwdriver. The screws were authentically antique, taken from another old piece of furniture, so that they were not obvious recent additions, and the floor panels of the chest were likewise aged oak, and only close examination by an expert would have revealed that they were not original. Once the screws were loose, Moses lifted out the panels to reveal the compartment beneath. This was tightly packed with cotton waste, and gently Moses worked it loose, and as he removed the top layer, placed it in the package that had contained the tools. Tara watched with awful fascination as the contents of the first secret compartment came into view. They were small rectangular blocks of some dark, amorphous material. The sticky toffee or carpenter's putty, each covered with a translucent, grease-proof wrapper and with a label marked in Russian Cyrillic script. There were ten blocks in the top layer, but Tara knew that there must be two layers below that, thirty blocks in all, each block weighing two pounds, which made a total of sixty pounds of plastic explosive. It looked mundane and harmless, as some kitchen commodity, but Moses had warned her of its lethal power. A two-pound brick will destroy the span of a steel bridge. Ten pounds would knock down the average house. Sixty pounds, he shrugged. It is enough to do the job ten times over. Once he had removed the packing and reassured himself of the contents, Moses replaced the panel and screwed it closed. Then he opened the centre panel of the floor. 
Again, it was packed with cotton waste. As he removed it, he explained in a whisper, There are four different types of detonators to cover all possible needs. These, he gingerly lifted a small flat tin the size of a cigarette pack out of its nest of cotton packing, these are electrical detonators that can be wired up to a series of batteries or to the mains. These, he returned the tin to its slot and lifted the loose cotton to reveal a second larger tin. These are radio receiver detonators and are set off by a VHF transmission from this miniature transmitter. It looked to Tara like one of the modern portable radios. Moses lifted it out of its nest. It needs only six torch batteries to activate it. Now these are simple acid time-fused detonators, primitive, and the time delay isn't very accurate. But this here is a trembler detonator. Once it is primed, the slightest movement or vibration will set it off. Only an expert will be able to defuse the charge once it is in place. Until this moment, she had considered only the abstract dialectic of what they were doing. But now she was faced with the actuality. Here before her was the very stuff of violent death and destruction. The innocent appearance no less menacing than the coils of a sleeping mamba. And she found herself wavering. Moses, she whispered. Nobody will be hurt. No human life. You said that, didn't you? We have discussed that already. The expression was cold and scornful, and she felt ashamed. Forgive me, please. Moses ignored her and unscrewed the third and last panel. This compartment contained an automatic pistol and four clips of ammunition. It took up little space, and the rest of the compartment was packed with cotton waste, which Moses removed. Give me the other packet, he ordered, and when she passed it to him, he began to pack the contents into the empty recess. Firstly, there was a compact tool kit which contained a keyhole saw and hand drill, drill bits and augers, a box of hearing aid batteries for the detonator and torch batteries for the transmitter, a pen light torch, a 500-foot roll of thin electrical wire, diamond glass cutters, putty, staples and tiny one-ounce tins of touch-up paint. Lastly, there was a pack of hard rations, dried biscuit and cans of meat and vegetables. I wish you'd allowed me to give you something more appetizing. It will be only two days, Moses said, and she was reminded how little store he set by creature comforts. Moses replaced the panel, but he did not tighten the retaining screws fully so that they could be loosened by hand. All right, now pass the books to me now. He repacked the chest, replacing the bundles in the same order as he had found them, so that to a casual glance it would not be apparent that the contents of the chest had been disturbed. Carefully Moses closed the chest and replaced the bronze statue on the lid. Then he stood in front of the desk and surveyed the room carefully. I will need a place to hide. The drapes, Tara suggested, and he nodded. Not very original, but effective. The curtains were embroidered brocade, cut full, and they reached to the floor. Uh, a key to that door. I'll need one, he indicated the hidden door in the panelling. I'll try, Tara began, and then broke off as there was a knock on the interleading door. For a moment he thought she might panic, and he squeezed her arm to calm her. Who is it? Tara called in a level voice. Uh, it's me, Mrs Courtney, Trisha called respectfully. Uh, it's one o'clock and I'm going to take my lunch. Uh, go ahead, Trisha. I'll be a little longer, but I'll lock up when I leave. They heard the outer door close, and then Moses released her arm. Go out and search her desk. See if she has a key to the back door. Tara was back within minutes with a small bunch of keys. She tried them in the lock, and the third one turned the door in the panelling. Uh, the serial number is on it. She scribbled a note of the number on Shaza's note block and ripped off the top sheet. I'll return the keys to Trisha's desk. When she came back, Moses was buttoning his uniform jacket, but she locked the door behind her. 
What I need now is a plan of the building. There must be one in the public works department, and you must get me a copy. And tell Trisha to do it. How? she asked. What excuse can I give? Uh, tell her that you want to change the lighting in here. He gestured at the chandelier in the roof. Uh, tell her you must have an electrical plan of this section, showing the circuits and wall fittings. Uh, yes, I can do that. Good. Uh, we are finished here for the time being. We can go now. Oh, there's no hurry, Moses. Trish will only be back in an hour. He looked down at her, and for a moment she thought she saw a flash of contempt, even disgust, in those dark, brooding eyes. But she would not let herself believe that. And she pressed herself to him, hiding her face against his chest. Within seconds she felt the swelling and hardening of his loins through the cloth that separated their lower bodies, and her doubts were dispelled. She was certain that in his own strange African way he loved her still, and she reached down to open his clothing and bring him out. He was so thick that she could barely encompass him within the circle of her thumb and forefinger. And he was hot and hard as a shaft of black ironstone that had lain in the full glare of the sun at midday. Tara sank down onto the thick silken rug, drawing him down on top of her. Every day now increased the danger of discovery, and both of them were aware of it. Will Shaza recognise you? Tara asked Moses more than once. It's becoming more and more difficult to keep you from meeting him face to face. He asked about my new chauffeur a few days ago. Isabella had apparently drawn Shaza's attention to the new employee for her own selfish reasons, and Tara could cheerfully have thrashed her for it. But there had been the danger of establishing the importance of her new driver even more clearly in the child's devious mind, so she had let it pass without comment. Will he know you? she insisted, and Moses considered it carefully. It was a long, long time ago. Before the war, he was a child. Moses shook his head. The circumstances were so different, the place so remote, and yet for a short while we were close. I believe we made a deep impression upon each other. If merely because of the unlikelihood of such a relationship, black man and white boy becoming familiar, developing an intimate friendship. He sighed. It is certain, however, that at the time of the trial, he must have read the intelligence reports and known of the warrant for my arrest, which, by the way, is still in force. Whether he would connect the wanted revolutionary criminal with his childhood friend, I do not know. But we cannot take that chance. We must do what has to be done as soon as possible. It seems that Shaza has been out of town every weekend for the last five years. Tara bit her lip with frustration. But now that I want him gone, he won't leave Fel to Frieden for a single day. First it's this damned polo business. The Argentinian polo team was touring the country, and Shaza was hosting their stay in Cape Town while the polo fields of Veltefrieden would be the venue for the first test match of their visit. Then immediately after that it will be the British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan's visit. Shaza won't be leaving Cape Town before the end of the month at the very earliest. She watched his face in the driving mirror as he pondered it. There is a risk either way, he said softly. To delay is as dangerous as to act hastily. We must choose the exact moment. Neither of them spoke again until they reached the bus stop, and Moses parked the chev on the opposite side of the road. Then he switched off the engine and asked, This polo match, when will it take place? The test match is on Friday afternoon. Your husband will be playing? The South African team will be announced in the middle of the week, but Shaza is almost certain to be on the team. He might even be chosen as captain. Even if he is not... He will be the host. He must be there. Yes, Tara agreed. Friday. That will give me the whole weekend. He made up his mind. We will do it then. For a few moments, Tara felt the suffocating desperation of somebody trapped in quicksand, sinking slowly. And yet there was an inevitability about it that made fear seem superfluous. There was no escape, 
and she felt instead an enervating sense of acceptance. Here is the bus, Moses said, and she heard the faintest tremor of excitement in his voice. It was one of the very few times that she had ever known his personal feelings to betray him. As the bus drew up at the halt, she saw the woman and child standing on the platform at the rear. They were both peering eagerly at the parked chev. And when Tara waved, the child hopped down and started to cross the road. The bus pulled away, and Miriam Africa stayed on the platform at the back of the bus, staring back at them until it turned the next corner. Benjamin came to meet them, his face bright with anticipation. He was growing into a likely lad, and Miriam always dressed him so well. Clean white shirt, grey shorts, and polished black shoes. His toffee-coloured skin had a scrubbed look, and his crisp, dark curls were trimmed into a neat cap. Isn't he just too gorgeous? Tara breathed. Our son, Moses. Our fine son. The boy opened the door and jumped in besides Moses. He looked up at him with a beaming smile, and Moses embraced him briefly. Then Tara leaned over the seat and kissed him, and gave him a brief but fierce hug. In public, she had to limit any show of affection, and as he grew older, their relationship became more difficult and obscure. The child still believed that Miriam Africa was his mother, but he was almost six years old now, and a bright, intelligent, and sensitive boy. She knew that he suspected some special relationship between the three of them. These clandestine meetings were too regular and emotionally charged for him not to suspect that something had remained to be fully explained to him. Benjamin had been told merely that they were good friends of the family, but even at his tender age, he would be aware of the social taboos that they were flouting, for his very existence must be permeated by the knowledge that white and black were somehow different and set apart from his own light brown. And sometimes he stared at Tara with a kind of wonder, as though she was some fabulous creature from a fairy tale. There was nothing Tara could think of that could fulfil her more than taking him in her arms and telling him, "You are my baby, my own true baby." and I love you as much as I love your father. But she could not even let him sit on the seat beside her in case they were seen together. They drove out across the Cape Flats towards Somerset West, but before they reached the village, Moses turned off onto a side track through the dense stands of Port Jackson Willow until they came out onto the long deserted curve of beach with the green waters of False Bay before them. And on each side, the mountainous ramparts that formed the horns of the wide bay. Moses parked the chev and fetched the picnic basket from the boot, and then the three of them followed the footpath along the top of the beach until they reached their favourite spot. From here, anyone approaching along the beach would be obvious from half a mile, while inland the exotic growth formed an almost impenetrable jungle. The only persons likely to venture this far along the lonely beach were surf fishermen casting into the tumbling waves for cob and steenbras, or lovers seeking seclusion. Here they felt safe. Tara helped Benjamin change into his bathing costume, and then all three of them went hand in hand to the enclosed rock pool, where the child splashed and played like a spaniel puppy. When at last he was chilled through and tired, Tara toweled down his shivering body and dressed him again. Then he helped Moses build a fire amongst the dunes and grill the raw sausages and chops upon the coals. After they had eaten, Benjamin wanted to swim again, but gently Tara forbade him. Not on a full stomach, darling. So he went to search for shells along the tide mark of the beach, and Tara and Moses sat on the crest of the dune and watched him. Tara was as happy and contented as she could ever remember being, until Moses broke the silence. This is what we are working for, he said. Dignity and a chance for happiness for all in this land. Yes, Moses, she whispered. It is worth any price. Oh, yes, she agreed fervently. Oh, yes. Part of the price is the execution of the architect of our misery, he said sharply. I have kept this from you until now, but for Wut must die and all his henchmen with him. Destiny has appointed me his executioner and his successor. 
Tara paled at his words. But they came as such a shock that she could not speak. Moses took her hand with a strange and unusual gentleness. For you, for me, and for the child, that he may live with us in the sunshine of freedom. She tried to speak, but her voice faltered, and he waited patiently until she was able to enunciate. Moses, you promised. No, he shook his head. You persuaded yourself of that, and it was not the time to disillusion you. Oh, God, Moses. The enormity of it crashed in upon her. I thought you were going to blow up the empty building as a symbolic gesture. But all along you planned to... She broke off, unable to complete the sentence, and he did not deny it. Moses, my husband Shaza, he will be on the bench beside Favut. Is he your husband? Moses asked. Is he not one of them? One of the enemy? She lowered her eyes to acknowledge the truth of this, and then suddenly she was agitated again. My father, he'll be in the house. Your father and your husband are part of your old life. You have left that behind you. Now, Tara, I am both your father and your husband, and the struggle is your new life. Moses, isn't there some way they can be spared? she pleaded. He did not speak, but she saw the answer in his eyes, and she covered her face with both hands and began to weep. She wept silently, but the spasms of grief shook her whole body. Down on the beach the child's happy cries came to her faintly on the wind, and beside her Moses sat unmoving and without expression. After a while she lifted her head and wiped the tears from her face with the palms of her hands. I'm sorry, Moses, she whispered. I was weak. Please forgive me. I was mourning my father, but now I'm strong again and ready to do whatever you require of me. The test match against the visiting Argentinian polo team was the most exciting event that had taken place at Veltefrieden in a decade or more. As mistress of the estate, the planning and organisation of the event should have fallen to Tara, but her lack of interest in the sport and her poor organisational skills were too much for Santon Courtney Malcolm S. to abide. She began by giving discreet advice and ended in exasperation by taking all responsibility out of her daughter-in-law's hands. The result was that the occasion was in every respect a towering success. After Santown had chivied the coloured greensman, and with Blaine's expert advice, the turf on the field was green and velvety, the going beneath it neither hard enough to jar the legs of the ponies, nor soft enough to slow them down. The goalposts were painted in the colours of the teams, the pale blue and white of Argentina, and orange, blue and white of South Africa, and two hundred flags in the same colours flew from the grandstand. The stand itself was freshly painted, as were the fence pickets and the stables. A fence was erected to keep the general public out of the chateau's private grounds, but the new facilities designed by Santon especially for the occasion included an extension to the grandstand, with public toilets below and an open-air restaurant that could seat two hundred guests. The extensions to the stables were sufficient for fifty ponies, and there were new quarters for the grooms. The Argentinians had brought their own, and they wore traditional gaucho costume, with wide hats and their chaps decorated with silver coins. Gary tore himself away from his new office at Santon House, which was on the top floor, only three doors down from Shaza, and he spent two days at the stables watching and learning from these masters of horsecraft and the game of polo. Michael had at last managed to secure an official assignment. He blissfully believed that the Golden City Mail in Johannesburg had appointed him their local correspondent on his own merits as a cub reporter. saint Anne, who had made a discreet telephone call to the chairman of Associated Newspapers of South Africa, who owned the Mail, did nothing to disillusion him. Michael was to be paid five guineas for the day, plus a shilling a word for any copy of his actually printed by the newspaper. He interviewed every member of both teams, including the reserves, all the grooms, the umpire and referees. 
He drew up a full history and scorecard of all previous matches played between the two countries, going back to the 1936 Olympic Games, and he worked out the pedigrees of all the ponies. But here he showed restraint by limiting the listing to only two generations. Even before the match day, he had written enough to make Gone with the Wind look like a pamphlet. Then he insisted on telephoning this important copy through to a long-suffering sub at the newspaper offices, and the telephone charges far outstripped his five-guinea salary. Anyway, Mickey, Shaza consoled him, if they print everything you have written at a shilling a word, you'll be a millionaire. The big disappointment for the family came on the Wednesday when the South African team was announced. Shaza was chosen to play in his usual position at number two, but he was passed over for the captaincy. This went to Max Tunison, a flamboyant, hard-riding millionaire farmer from Natal, who was a long-time rival of Shaza's, ever since their first meeting on the same field as juniors many years before. Shaza hid his disappointment behind a rueful grin. It means more to Max than it does to me, he told Blaine, who was one of the selectors. And Blaine nodded. Yes, he agreed. That's why we gave it to him, Shaza. Max values it. Isabella fell desperately in love with the Argentinian number four, a paragon of masculinity with olive skin, dark flashing eyes, thick wavy hair and dazzling white teeth. She changed her frock three and four times a day, trying out all the most sophisticated of the clothes with which Shaza had filled her wardrobes. She even applied a very light coat of rouge and lipstick, not enough to catch Shaza's attention, but just enough, she hoped, to pique José Jesus González de Santos' interest. She exercised all her ingenuity in waylaying him, hanging around the stables endlessly and practising her most languid poses whenever he hove into view. The object of her adoration was a man in his early thirties who was convinced that the Argentinian male was the world's greatest lover and that he, José Jesus González de Santos, was the national champion. There were at least a dozen mature and willing ladies vying for his attention at any one time. He did not even notice the antics of this 14-year-old child. But Santon did. You are making an exhibition of yourself, Bella, she told her. From now on you are forbidden to go near the stables. And if I see one speck of makeup on your face again, you may be certain your father will learn all about it. Nobody went against Nana's orders, not even the boldest and most lovelorn. So Isabella was forced to abandon her fantasy of ambushing José in the hayloft above the stables and presenting him with her virginity. Isabella was not entirely certain what this entailed. Lenora had lent her a forbidding book which referred to it as a pearl beyond price. Whatever it was, José Jesus could have her pearl and anything else he wanted. However, Nana's strictures reduced her to trailing around after him at a discreet distance and directing burning but long-range looks at him whenever he glanced in her direction. Gary intercepted one of these passionate looks and was so alarmed by it that he demanded in a loud voice and within earshot of her beloved, Are you sick, Bella? You keep looking like you're going to throw up. It was the first time in her life that she truly hated her middle brother. Santon had planned for 2,000 spectators. Polo was an elite sport with a limited following, and at two pounds each, tickets were expensive. But on the day, the gate exceeded 5,000. This guaranteed the club a healthy profit, but put a considerable strain on Santon's logistics. All her reserves, which included Tara, were thrown in to deal with the overflow and to organise the additional food and drink required and only when the teams rode out onto the field could Tara escape her mother-in-law's all-seeing eye and go up into the stand. For the first chucker, Shaza was riding a bay gelding whose hide was burnished until it shone like a mirror in the sunlight. In his green jersey, piped with gold, and his snowy white breeches and glossy black boots, Tara had to admit to herself that Shaza looked magnificent. As he cantered below the stand, he looked up and smiled, the black eye patch gave an intriguing, sinister nuance to his otherwise boyish and charming grin. And despite herself, Tara responded, waving to him, until she realised that Shaza was not smiling at her, but at someone below her in the stand. 
feeling a little foolish, she stood on tiptoe and peered down to try and see who it was. The woman was tall with a narrow waist, but her face was obscured by the brim of a garden party hat decorated with roses. However, the arm she lifted to wave at Shaza was slim and tanned, with diamond engagement and gold wedding rings on the third finger of her shapely hand. Tara turned away and removed her hat so that Santon could not easily pick her out of the crowd, and she worked her way quickly but unobtrusively to the side exit of the stand. As she crossed the car park and headed around the back of the stables, the first roaring chair went up from the stand. Nobody would look for her for a couple of hours now, and she began to run. Moses had the chef parked in the plantation of pines near the guest cottages, and she pulled open the back door and tumbled into the seat. Nobody saw me leave, she panted. And he started the engine and drove sedately down the long driveway and out through the Unreath gateway. Tara checked her wristwatch. It was a few minutes past three o'clock, but it would take forty minutes to round the mountain and reach the city. They would reach the Parliament building at four o'clock when the doormen were thinking about their tea break. It was a Friday afternoon and the house was in committee of supply, the kind of boring, routine business which would leave the members nodding on the benches. In fact, Blaine and Shaza had tactfully arranged the schedule with the whips so that they and quite a few of their peers might sneak away to the polo without missing any important debate or division. Many of the other members must have made plans to leave early for the weekend, for the building was quiet and the lobby almost deserted. Moses parked in the members' car park and went around to the back of the station wagon to bring out the packages. Then he followed Tara at a respectful distance as she climbed the front staircase. Nobody challenged them. It was all so easy, almost an anticlimax. And they went up to the second floor, past the press gallery entrance, where Tara had a glimpse of three junior reporters slumped dispiritedly on their benches as they listened to the Honourable Minister of Posts and Telegraphs droning out his self-congratulations on the exemplary fashion in which he had conducted his department during the previous fiscal year. Tricia was sitting behind her desk, in the outer office, painting her fingernails with varnish, and she looked flustered and guilty as Tara walked in. "'Oh, Tricia, that is a pretty colour," Tara said sweetly, and Tricia tried to look as though her fingers didn't belong to her, but the varnish was wet and she didn't quite know what to do with them. I finished all the letters Mr Courtney left for me, she tried to excuse herself, and it's been so quiet today and I've got a, a date tonight. I just thought... <laughs> she petered out lamely. I've brought up some samples of curtain material, Tara told her. I thought we'd change them when we installed the new light fittings. I would like it to be a surprise for Shaza, so don't mention it to him if you can avoid it. Of course not, Mrs Courtney. I'll be trying to work out the new colour scheme for the curtains, and I'll probably be here until long after five o'clock. If you've finished your work, why don't you go off early? I'll take any phone calls. Oh, I'd feel bad about that, Tricia protested half-heartedly. Oh, off you go, Tara ordered firmly. I'll hold the fort. You enjoy your date. I hope you have a lovely evening. It's so kind of you, Mrs Courtney, it really is. Stephen, take those samples through and put them on the couch, please, Tara ordered, without looking at Moses, and she lingered while Trisha cleared her desk with alacrity and headed for the door. Have a super weekend, Mrs Courtney, and thanks a lot. Tara locked the door after her and hurried through to the inner office. That was a bit of luck, she whispered. We should give her some time to get clear, Moses told her and they sat side by side on the sofa. Tara looked nervous and unhappy, but she kept silent for many minutes before she blurted out, Moses, about my father and Shaza. Yes? he asked, but his voice was bleak, and she hesitated, twisting her fingers nervously. Yes? he insisted. No, you're right, she sighed. It has to be done. I must be strong. Yes, you must be strong he agreed. But now you must go and leave me to do my work. She stood up. Kiss me, please, Moses, she whispered, and then after a moment broke from his embrace. Good luck, she said softly. 
She locked the outer door of the office and went down the staircase into the main lobby. And halfway down, she was suddenly overwhelmed by a sense of doom. It was so strong that she felt the blood drain from her head and an icy sweat broke out on her forehead and upper lip. For a moment she felt dizzy and had to clutch the banisters to prevent herself from falling. Then she forced herself to go on down and cross the lobby. The janitor was staring at her strangely. She kept walking. He was leaving his cubicle and coming to intercept her. She felt panic come at her and she wanted to turn and run back up the stairs to warn Moses that they had been discovered. Uh, Mrs Courtney, the janitor stopped in front of her, blocking her path. What is it? she faltered, trying to think up a plausible reply to his demands. I've got a small bet on the polo this afternoon. Uh, do you know how it's going? She stared at him, and for a moment it did not make sense. She almost blurted out, Polo? What polo? And then she caught herself, and with an enormous effort of will and concentration, chatted with the man for almost a minute before she could escape. In the car park, she could no longer control her panic, and she ran to the chev and flung herself behind the wheel, sobbing for breath.